Hello, friends. Welcome to the Deeg Podcast. I'm Deeg, here today talking to McLean Deemer, the lead composer for Guild Wars 2. He worked on End of Dragons, the expansion that just launched back in February. He also was a lead composer for uh, Path of Fire and Heart of Thorns, other Guild Wars 2 expansions, as well as other various gaming projects. Hi, McLean. How's it going? Very good, Deeg. How are you? Uh, I am awesome. You know, McLean, I am... I one of the main reasons I wanted to talk to you uh, was because I'm kind of enchanted by your story, and I'm really curious wow. about it. Uh, okay. So, I got to know your work when I started playing Guild Wars Two back in 2015 in the lead up to Heart of Thorns. You know, mm -hmm. there was all that great press build up, all the stories and media things happening, and of course, among that was the music of Heart of Thorns. Your awesome. Uh, uh, Heart of Thorns theme that I still hear like every once in a while, just walking around into and stuff, <laughs> just rattling around up there, and I love it. Um, but I understand that before you uh, worked as lead composer on Heart of Thorns back in 2015, that you were an audio designer at ArenaNet. I'd love to hear the story of how someone working in audio design ended up being a lead composer, and also just how you got into games, uh, the world of games in the first place. Um, Start the story wherever it makes sense to you. Uh, I'm just so interested. Sure. Um, yeah, so it was uh, like a lot of people in games in general, and especially in game audio, you know, the, my path is very serpentine. Um, huh. when, uh, when I was getting out of school, I'll try, to keep, I'll try to keep this somewhat brief, but when I was getting out of college, I went to music college, the Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Um, my sister went there. Oh, oh really? Wild. Yeah, she huh, would have been cool. there in the like like two thousand three, four, five, something like that. I think. Okay, I graduated in two thousand three, so wow. I was okay. I was around Boston, but I, I wouldn't have been at school anymore. Um, but that's Small funny. Work. Anyway, go on. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so when I was getting out of there, that you know, like I said, I graduated in two thousand three, which is a very long time ago now. But um, back then was the first sort of wave of these, you know, news articles that we still see almost 20 years later that would say things like video game sales have outgrossed movie uh, tickets and CD sales combined for the year, right? Uh, and there was all this palpable fear in the music industry about the rise of downloading and MP3s and Napster and all that stuff was happening when I was in college. Mm -hmm. and, um, and people were very scared. Uh, that it was going to destroy the music industry, and it did. Uh, which you know, their fears were were well founded. But we were sort of kids, and we're like, no, this is the future, and you know, get out of the way, old man. And uh, you know, World they were right. For the young, Absolutely. yeah, yeah, but <laughs> but uh, but not the music industry, unfortunately. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, when I got out, I was I, I wanted to be a rock star. That was just uh, you know my dream, and I figured I should should give it a shot and uh who were your inspirations for being a rock star um i mean i was I, i'm a guitar player right so okay. so and um i sort of grew up on a steady diet of just classic rock via my dad it's funny now again thinking about um how long ago I was in school like when i was in college some of my favorite records were as old as my distance now from when i was in college right so it's mm. like they, they see it seemed so ancient. And my dad used to say things like, well, when I was, you know, your age that we didn't call this classic rock. This was just rock. This is what was on the radio. And, and so much of what I liked was from before I was born. And now it's uh -huh. like, you know, uh, I, I, yeah, like it was that, that stuff was barely 20, 25 years old. And, and I still have very fresh memories of 20 years ago and 25 years ago. Uh, and anyway, time is all relative and squishy and, and uh, weird and, if you look back from from your position now on on what would have been modern rock twenty years ago when you were loving classic rock, do you see it the same way you saw classic rock back then, or is that a whole different way of seeing it? No, I, I have no nostalgia for the '90s musically. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I love um, I love Nirvana and Soundgarden and some and those that early wave of of uh, grunge and alternative rock. Love that stuff. Everything else that came after that, I I just was I was so against it when I, even back then i was like this stuff sucks it's all sounds super derivative and it's so metal. yeah and that, that that hit when i was like a senior in high school and just like ultra cynical about everything like you know you're 17 and 18 and your opinions are hard and fast and Im immovable 
But and your music you know, is part of your identity at that age too. That's so important at that age. Absolutely. And of course, I mean, music is still an important part of my identity. So I was still finding out who I was as a person. I will say that the stuff from that era that I do like is actually more electronic music, which which I despised when I was a kid. I just was like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't let any of my friends like put that stuff in my CD player, my tape player, in my car, but stuff like the chemical brothers uh, yeah. and, uh, and like UK drum and bass and stuff. I, I love that stuff now. Um, and I really didn't appreciate it at the time uh, to my detriment, but you know, that gives me some fun new stuff to listen to. But as far as, far as rock music, nineties, I've no, no rose colored glasses for I was like, maybe if I was five or 10 years younger, I'm sort of on the the borderline between Gen X and millennial. Sure. So I was like a little too old to, to feel like, uh, you know, for me, my sort of golden fuzzy memories is from like 87 to 92 mm -hmm. when I'm like, Oh, going to the mall and hearing Huey Lewis on the radio. Like that yeah. to me is a fun memory. Anyway, your original question was who are my influences? Uh, you know, like I said, classic rock, I just love the Beatles. Beatles are like my number one, they're far and away number one for me. I just love yeah, them so yeah. much. Um, and uh, in terms of guitar players, when I was a teenager, I was all about Eddie Van Halen. Um, and I don't even, I don't really even love, I'm not a metal guy and I don't really even enjoy hair metal, like the sort of fallout from Van Halen, but I love Van Halen so much. I still do. I think the guy was, I mean, on the Mount Rushmore, it's, you know, uh, it's Chuck Berry, it's Jimi Hendrix, and it's Eddie Van Halen. It's just like the guy's unbelievable. Yeah. Um, Eddie transcends the art form. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He's he's just from another planet. Um, and then you know the Who. The Who is probably my favorite of the. You know, if I sort of putting the Beatles aside in their own little glass case, mm. the Who and the Beach Boys are probably my other two. That, that, that's a pretty good Mount Rushmore. It's like the Beatles, the Who, the Beach Boys. Van Halen. <laughs> okay. Okay. I would say you mix all that up and then you kind of get me, but you know, it's funny in terms of my guitar playing, I never really got, I never really did a lot of shredding. I mean, I can play fast when I'm sort of warmed up and stuff, but I really like, like my sort of the, the guitar solos that I enjoy are like Brian May, I love Brian May. And, um, and David Gilmore is like one of my mm -hmm. heroes uh, and just because he's tasteful. Right. Uh, wow. And his tone is amazing. So yeah, that's, that's that's kind of it. That's that's sort of me in a nutshell in terms of uh, you know pre orchestral writing in my 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 delusional rock star days. Um, okay, Why so speaking of, well, because you know uh, because it's impossible and it's even less possible now. Um, you know, not like it's not like it's ever been easy, but but yeah. it's you know it's 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 like winning the lottery. Probably have better odds of winning the lottery. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then nowadays kids don't listen to rock music. So it's like, I, I, yeah. I, I'm sure you can make a living still playing guitar and playing in bands and stuff. And in terms of hitting a sort of stratosphere, that era is, is long gone. Um, sure. and yeah. it, that's fine. You know what I mean? It's, it happens. Uh, and it doesn't, I don't think it diminishes the quality of any of that music. It's just, you know, yeah. things have to develop and, and move forward. I heard a great uh, quote from you in another interview you gave where you, you talked about going to see the who live when they were older kind of past their performing prime. And you've made the point yeah. that they were, what was so great about The Who wasn't necessarily their studio work, but their live work. And yeah. you shared the insight that you had after you left that concert that those those four guys in their older years were, a, and, and like with some substitutions, not even the whole original band, were a better band than you'll ever be. That's what I heard yeah. you say. That's a hell of a thing to, to, to realize. Yeah, well, you know, it's not like I it's I don't I didn't mean that in a self-deprecating way, but it's just it was it was a way for me to shake off that kind of snobbiness that I had as a teenager about, mm -hmm. well, if I love the who, then why would I want to see them at, you know, the county? Not that they're playing county fairs, but the equivalent. Right. And there are other bands I like that were definitely on the county fair circuit, like Kansas or something like that. Uh, but, you know, um, they're, they're going to be gone at some point. And if they truly mean something to me, then I should go see them no matter what state they're in, unless it's just really embarrassing. And, and that unfortunately happens to people as they get older. And, and uh, you know, these sort of like cringe videos end up leaking out to be like, look how look how much this guy sucks now. And it's like, well, OK, but he's getting old. Like you're going to get old, too. Right. But but these guys uh, and, and, you know, it's funny what happened with The Who. So a couple years after that concert, which was unbelievable, they played the Super Bowl halftime show and it wasn't a great show. And I think they would probably even admit that. 
And so people just want to dunk on them be like, these old, who are these old guys up, up there just fumbling around, which I think is unfair to them. But, um, you know, yeah, I, 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 it's funny. A few weeks ago, I went to go see journey, uh, mm. here in Los Angeles. Um, and I, I had the same realization. I mean, that band has gone through so many iterations mm. in the last, I mean, the people, they've been around for longer, I think, than people realize, right. They've been around for almost, uh, they've probably been around for about 50 years, uh, and then, you know, their heyday obviously was like late, very late 70s into the 80s. Um, but so in terms of original members, there's there's literally one original guy left in it, Neil Sean, who's the guitar player. Mm -hmm. And then from their sort of peak radio hit era, the the piano player is still in the band, Jonathan something or other. Sorry if, if he's watching. Uh, uh, so they're the two original guys and everybody else is all fill-ins, including the lead singer, which has this, there's this famous story about him, about how they found him on YouTube doing covers like this. He was essentially in, in um, bar bands in the Philippines. He's like a Filipino uh -huh. guy. And he, somebody just was posting or it was him. He was posting videos of his performances in like cover bands and bar bands and stuff on YouTube. And, they, and the band found him when they were thinking about going back on the road because Steve Perry, who was their previous singer had developed stage fright issues and could just couldn't sing that way anymore. Mm. Anyway. So the whole band is, is all sort of ringers except for these two guys. And, and they're not young, you know, they're definitely not young. Neil Sean's probably 70 something now. Um, mm -hmm. But I went to go see them at, a, you know, at a big arena here in LA and they were so good. They were mm -hmm. unbelievable. Like just the same thing where I'm like, these guys are just the best. They're like, they're the top of their game still as professional musicians. And they're just a great band. And here they are in this arena with 20,000 plus people yeah. singing along with every song and having a great time. And, 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 Sorry, this is a long-winded way of making the art my of point. Four guys like, on stage. Yeah, yeah. When I mean, when I was a kid, I would have just been like, "This sucks." I want I, I want to see them at you know the Isle of Wight Festival in 1970, which is, of course yeah. is impossible because I wasn't alive back then. Um, and so you know, it, it sort of made me realize that I need to just appreciate these people if, if they truly are heroes to me. Then I have to you know appreciate them for who they are and what they are, and see them while they're around because eventually I'm going to outlive theoretically all of the people who mean the most to me in the world. Right. Um, and that's already started to happen. Like I'm not young and I'm not getting any younger uh, and neither are these guys. So yeah. um, I think it's important to kind of keep that perspective. Yeah. And in the age of the internet, we will the, the, the privilege of being able to only see a version of someone as they were at their peak. Well, yeah, we're seeing everyone at all stages now, like yeah. the beginning of history, it feels like in some way. Yeah, it's I don't know. It's an interesting time to be alive, and and um, there's good and bad along with that. But but uh, I, I'm sort of happy to be alive in this age because I'm a curious person. I like knowing things and and feeling connected with other people, and that's probably the, the the greatest benefit I think of being alive right now. Not to diminish all the terrible things about being alive, but there's always been bad things, um, and there always will be. I'm not I'm not uh, I'm not that much of an optimist. <laughs> yeah, um, a little bit of optimism, good. Yeah, yeah right just a little, you, by the way. just a little bit. Yeah, a healthy balance. Um, so, yeah. So anyway, so when I was getting out of school, the game thing, I, what I, I was like, it, it was always in the back of my mind. Right. Mm -hmm. um, because that era was the PlayStation 2 era that I was in college and, and high quality music was more the norm than the exception. Right. We, we were the industry was almost completely moved on from the onboard sound chips on the consoles and the limitations that, that, that brings um, to doing not like orchestra is the sort of pinnacle, uh, but, but being able to have pre-recorded music as if it's just an actual album rather than relying on hardware and those kinds of limitations. So I thought, well, this isn't, this is interesting. And based on these news articles, it seems like it's a growing field, but I should, at the very least try to be a rock star because it's a young man's game. Yeah. Um, and, and I had a lot of fun. It was great. Uh, and, uh, eventually sort of like, a, uh, you know, was saying I was in Boston and Boston at the time looked like it was this up and coming game development hub. Um, it ended up kind of collapsing about a decade ago, but, but until then, it, it just kept growing and growing. And, you know, at the time, still, even now there's, there's very, there's not nearly as much game development on the East Coast as there is on the West Coast of the yeah. United States. Yeah. And I would say most of it is centered around Epic in North Carolina, you know, um, uh, but but the majority of it is still out West in Seattle and in Los Angeles and scattered in a couple other spots. But Boston looked like it was exploding. 
Um, and I ended up through my sort of network of band people, uh, met a guy who was a programmer. Um, his name is Bryn Bennett. And he was working at a studio called Iron Lore, which no longer exists, but they made a game called Titan Quest, which was uh, a Diablo clone. And this was, this was before Diablo 3 came out. It just kind of seemed like there was a market for Diablo type games, but nobody was making them. So these guys kind of stepped in and, and it's still a really fun game. Um, so he was working on that game. I got introduced to him and I said, you know, I'm, I'm really curious about game audio, just working in games, you know? And he said, well, even though he was a musician, he's like, well, I don't really do that you know, I'm in my sort of game development life, but if you want, you can come into the studio and I'll introduce you to the audio director and you can, you know, talk to him a little bit. So I did, and and uh, and that studio it was there was one guy who was I think he wrote all the music and did all the all of the audio. It was just one guy, but it was really that was my first time seeing this type of work as a as a job, like seeing the tools he used and how he implemented the music and and understanding like, getting exposed to that for the first time. What do you think? Oh, it was mind blowing. Um, you know, because I, I truly had no concept. Like I didn't. I don't have a programming background. I didn't go to, you know, I didn't take any computer science class. I like strictly focused on music yeah. from the time I was, you know, a teenager through college. Um, and so being in this kind of office environment and seeing that, uh, you know, it is work, it's, uh, but it, but it's fun. And this guy had a cool office where, you know, he was in a sound kind of like this. He was in a room by himself, uh, which is the audio person's lot in life. Um <laughs> And then, you know, the way he would sort of implement the music, uh, this was, a, it was a proprietary tool. I'm not, you know, I don't know if it had an, or maybe it wasn't, I, it was so long ago, I don't remember, but the way he would sort of lay in ambient sound effects and music was, he would kind of paint it in on this grid. Um, and, you know, there's different ways of doing it. Now it's much more common to like draw in a perimeter or create sort of a giant dome um, hmm. that will trigger music when you enter into a certain area, but it all depends on the type of game and the type of engine you're using. But yeah, he was doing it, like painting it in on this isometric grid. And I was like, whoa, this is so cool. This seems really cool. <laughs> um, and then from there, so then eventually I ended up uh, in a band with this guy, um, which was the most, probably the most, the closest we got to being rock stars. Uh, it's a band called Bang Camaro, which was this kind of novelty band. It's not a joke band. It's hard, hard to describe because we took it seriously, but it was definitely a novelty band. Um, and it was sort of a throwback, hard rock, heavy metal thing. If you Google it, you'll find very fun pictures of, of a bunch of sweaty dudes on stage. Um, <laughs> but uh, my first sort of game credit in terms of music was they were working on a sequel or a, a DLC like expansion to Titan Quest, the studio Iron Lore. And the audio director said, hey, can you guys um, do like, can you write a song based around the theme of the game? Hmm. And, uh, and we did, it's called rock of mages. Um, and, <laughs> and, uh, why, <laughs> why the name? Well, oh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it, like I said, we're sort of this throwback homage to eighties, hard rock hair metal sort of stuff okay. and rock okay. of ages, right. Is this big, is yeah. one of the you know, big Def Leppard songs. And, and then, so we're like, okay, this will be funny. Cause this is a fantasy game. So rock of mages, right. Um, sure. And in, in that song, it was just a song that we had or we were working on some riffs or something. And then we incorporated the kind of melodic, melodic motif of Titan Quest into it. And then it played during the end credits, I think, when you beat when you beat the game. So that was technically my first real video game credit. But as part of a band and not really, you know, it's like that's like a fun bar trivia kind of question. It's that's not a cool not, one. Rock yeah, yeah. Um, and then so that guy, Bryn, uh, ended up. Uh, so let's see titan quest came out and then i think the studio limped along a little bit but then it shut down and so he went and got a job at harmonics music oh. systems which are the makers of guitar hero one and two and the rock band series and dance central right. and a bunch of other stuff but at the time it was like the peak of rock band um so he got a job there while we were in this band uh he got some of our songs in the game they're like Perf the, the perfect songs for those kinds of games because it's all just guitar solos and you know very very fun and it just matched up with the gameplay of those band of uh, those games you know perfectly so that being in those games kind of gave us a little bit of notoriety nationally and allow allowed us to tour the country um and and you know sell tickets <laughs> to venues oh, cool. 
uh, yeah, so that, that was a lot of fun that, that, you know, when it was fun, it was really fun. When it wasn't fun, it was a nightmare. And I did it for about three or four years before I just had had enough. Um, this could be a whole other two hour conversation, mm-hmm. but, you know, being in a band, even, even in the smallest band, like a three person band, you know, it's the metaphor that people make is it's like having multiple girlfriends. Right. And it's just about balancing your commitments and your egos and all this nightmare stuff. And this band had so many people in it. it, you know, the makeup of the band was there were five of us that played the instruments. There were three guitar players, a bass player and a drummer. Uh-huh. And then there were anywhere from 10 to 20 lead singers so that we could re- kind of recreate that big Def Leppard, like sing along shout oh, chorus. Yeah. Right. But do it live. So you're just, you, it, it was so, it, it was so much fun when it was working and when the crowd was into it, but the logistics of operating a band like that are, are just ridiculous. And, um, and, you know, a little bit of success goes to people's heads in different ways. Uh, and, you know, I wasn't, I, I was like, how do I, how do I say this? I was not a founding member. It started as kind of a fun goof where it wasn't really a, a band. They were just kind of, it was a recording project. And then we just, they had decided to put a band together. And that was when I joined so I didn't have any kind of decision-making power in that band. And I felt like the people who did have the decision-making power were not people that I wanted making decisions about my life. Ooh, uh, yeah. So, so I ended up leaving. And when I left Bryn again, um, was still working at harmonics and, and rock band was just exploding rock band one had already come out and they were in the run up to launching rock band two. And they just needed warm bodies to come and help them, you know, f- keep making these games. So he said, uh, you know, hey, if you're still interested in in working in games, um, uh, give me your resume and I'll see what I can do. And at that point, I was so desperate. I, I'd already applied to, I think, the only game company I, I had seriously applied to at that point was um, Irrational, which was also in Boston at the time. Uh, okay. And I, th- I think Bioshock had come out, um, but it might not have. But I knew a couple of people at Irrational, uh, some of which were in this band as well. Um, and uh, anyway, so that I didn't get the job because I wasn't qualified, uh, but uh, at Irrational, but I did get the job at Harmonix. Like I was, you know, my sort of civilian life was I was working in offices, just dead end type jobs, uh, no slight against people that have to do that for a living, but it was like, and I was working at Trader Joe's and I was just kind of job hopping every sure. six months, eight months, just trying just to paying the rent. pay my rent and not have any responsibility. Like if I had to go on tour, I could just quit and yeah. not worry about it. Um, but I was, I felt like I was at the end of that stage of my life and I couldn't do that forever. I needed right. to find a career. Um, and the game thing, it just came along at the right time. It happened to be this amazing opportunity and something that was creatively very satisfying, uh, you know, scratched a creative itch that being in bands was not really scratching anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so, you know, I'm very grateful to, you know, have, have been given that opportunity by Bryn. I'm so friends with him to this day. I talk to him all the time. Cool. Um, cool. And What's that was kind most... of, the... sorry, go ahead. Sorry. I was, I was just saying, that's, that's the start. That, that was the start of it all. Sure. Awesome. What I'm curious to ask you, and maybe you're going to get to this, but what, what the location of that creative itch is for work, uh, working in games versus working in, uh, versus being in a band. Like what's, how would you describe that difference in terms of the creative satisfaction? Yeah. Um, well, you know, every, every, both working in games, like I said, it, it is work. And that means there are things that are not that fun about it. Um, just logistical things. Um, and, and being in a band, if you're trying to make it as a professional, that also turns it into work. Right. Um, and, you know, I try to never lose sight of what my goal is in life, which is to just, be creative and stretch my own boundaries for what I'm capable of as, as an artist, um, okay. whether it's you doing commercial work, right. And not commercials like television, but uh, games do this sort of the creative aspects of my life now are right. for, for companies and working in entertainment. And there, there's a commercial aspect to that. I'm not sitting in my room, just sort of daydreaming and putting out albums right. every couple of years uh, for my own satisfaction. So, um, but, but yeah, I want to, just find my own sort of limits and then go past them. Right. Uh, Uh And I think that that is what motivates any creative person is, is you find something that says, Oh, this, this allows me to express some aspect of myself that I can't express any other way. 
Mm-hmm. So words aren't enough for it. Actions aren't enough for it. For me, it's music. Um, and there's something ineffable about it. But when I make music, it's like deeply satisfying for me, um, whether or not anybody hears it. Right. Uh, and then, you know, I'm lucky enough that people do hear it and they like it. And that allows me to get paid for it, which is a nice thing. Um, so w- with being in a band, I thought I'm more than just a guitar player. Right. Um, and even in the bands I was in, I was, I was always sort of a guitar and keyboard player because I'm not a great piano player, but I can play it enough that, you know, if, it, if that's the thing that differentiates you from the 10 billion other guitar players, then you're going to get the gig. Yeah. Uh, so I'd always be the sort of utility man. But um, I, I also, when, when we're making out al- records and write, recording songs and stuff, I, I, the things that get me going are not just, am I playing to the best of my ability? I hate practicing and I hate working on just that one thing. I'm not, Mm. I'm not, you know, just a a guitarist or a performer in that sense. I'm a big picture guy. I like to see how it all fits together. Mm -hmm. I want to learn about recording and mixing and, you know, all the arranging and, you know, the, the kind of high level picture of what it takes to put together music. Um, And being in a band, it just wasn't, there's some, there's a democratic element to it that can be interesting from a creative standpoint where everybody sort of contributes an idea. Uh, but more horizontal it, compared to, I imagine the way the game, game audio, game audio gets made. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it just wasn't doing it for me anymore. I'm like, all right, yeah. another riff, you know, and here come in, in another solo that we got to do. And I don't know, it just, it, it starts to get repeat itself. You start to see the same patterns over and over again. And you're like, yeah, next? yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, the, the, the blessing and a curse of being in a band that has any sort of measure of success is that the people who are, who prop you up, want you to kind of keep doing the same thing. Right. Yep. Um, uh, or don't change too much. Cause we don't like that anymore. Um, so anyway, I, I, I was happy to kind of walk away from all that and and see, is there, is there some, something else that will utilize this skill set that I have in terms of my ear for things, um, my ability to record and produce material on a computer and in a studio environment, uh, and, and, you know, but will like push me, is there something that will challenge me and being in a band yeah. at that point wasn't, wasn't a challenge. I didn't think, um, okay. yeah. So, so with game audio, you know, the output, when I was just doing sound design, the, the, the output is not musical in, in, a, in the most literal sense. Um, sure. but there is the, the process of getting there is very similar to how you produce music, um, you know, in a, in a kind of studio environment. And it utilizes a lot of the same skill sets. And, and I just thought, you know, that was an interesting challenge. And I have heroes who are, who are sound designers to the same way I do as musicians, right? Like um, I love behind the scenes kind of stuff on movies and TV shows. And I loved, you know, like a lot of people seeing, seeing Ben Burt do his work on Star Wars and Indiana Jones and all the Lucasfilm stuff. I mean, that guy's a legend. And his, you know, the way he thinks about sound and approaches it is, is that guy's a Titan. So I thought, well, that, that seems like a fun, that seems like a fun creative outlet that yeah. will, that will allow me to do this, some of the things I'm good at and and let me just be creative. I just wanted to be creative day to day. Right. Yeah. Not, not, yeah. And not checking, checking out people at the grocery store or, uh, you know, entering information into spreadsheets like i was doing in offices and even though you know you can't escape spreadsheets unfortunately but um <laughs> in the service of something creative i guess is i'm happy uh, to deal with spreadsheets so yeah life. yeah yeah so that was um that was kind of the motivation to to you know see where the game audio thread would lead me and uh and i'm very happy with that choice and that led you to harmonics yeah uh, so harmonics, like I said, it, what's interesting about harmonics is that in the audio department, our roles were composer slash sound designer or sound designer slash composer. And that was just a, a formality because we didn't do either of those things. You know, we, our job was to get music licensed from other bands um, and uh, then we get distributed around the audio department, which was massive. I mean, when I was there, there was maybe 35 people at, at its peak, which is ridiculous for an audio department. Mm. But what we were doing was taking these songs and not transcribing them literally, but converting them into the patterns that you play on screen, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so they wanted to hire musicians specifically so that they could try to convey the feeling of what it might be like to play the real thing mapped to these five different colored buttons, um, uh-huh. but translate it with some level of authenticity. 
So that was really what I did, you know, for the couple of years that I worked there. There was occasionally opportunities to do some sound design work, mostly for UI stuff. Um, very light though. And then, you know, there was there was kind of a bottleneck. Like some of the people who'd been there who were more senior got to do the fun stuff like marketing trailers and things where there was more traditional sound design and stuff. Mm. But yeah, in terms of composition, there was almost none because it's all the whole point of the game is it's reliant on other people's music. Um, right. The closest I got was for the Beatles rock band, uh, where me and a, and one other person wrote a sort of fake Beatles song that was the uh, the tutorial, like that, that was teaching people how to play rock band. Huh. You know, um, we, they just needed something simple that was that would loop and that they could break down into the different parts. Like, here's the guitar part, now play along with this. Uh -huh. So we wrote this kind of fake Beatles song, um, and that was pretty. That's the only music I ever wrote for a harmonics game. Uh, and oh, my guess is maybe a few hundred people ever even played it that mode and heard it. Um, so yeah, so but it would but I learned I learned how games were made, right? I, I learned uh, you know the, the the development cycle there was so rapid at that point they were essentially putting out a new game every year, mm -hmm. um, and then in between there was weekly DLC uh, for the entire time that I was there, right? So we're wow. putting out song packs or full albums every single week. Uh, and you just get to learn very quickly how to do the technical side of game development, like how to mm -hmm. submit things on a, a, you know, a program called Perforce or, what, or what's called version control, which is just right. a sort of safety mechanism for um, a centralized branch of a game that everybody sort of submits to. Um, yep. And, uh, and you know, dealing with QA uh, certif certification for different consoles and, and, using their their audio tools and all, all that kind of stuff it was it was it was a very rapid education on how to make games sure. um, and then all of a sudden after two years you know on paper it looks like i've shipped a lot of games right like i'd ship i'm technically in the credits of rock band 2 i didn't really do much for that but I, but they they wanted to give us credit because when i was hired i was immediately put on the weekly dlc and that eased the burden on the people who are still trying to finish rock band 2 sure. so it's like technically i was given a credit on that um yeah, that and then Kind of. Uh, and, and then the Beatles Rock Band, of course, uh, Rock Band 3. Those were the games that I, like disc titles that I put the most work into. Um, uh -huh. I, have a, I have a credit on Dance Central, the original one, but I, I didn't really do anything for that game either. Uh, so, uh, and then tons and tons of DLC, right? And then I think maybe there might be, maybe it's the Green Day Rock Band. I can't remember, but there was there was a lot happening at that time. So on paper, yeah, my resume all of a sudden is like goes from zero to like four or five ship titles in nice. the span of a couple of years. Nice. Um, but I got really tired of speaking of doing the same thing over and over again. It was just very repetitive. And I realized that there was not an opportunity to grow in the way that I wanted to. Um, mm -hmm. But by the nature of the games they make and the seniority of people that were there, uh, there was a lot more people in line that were going to get to do more high level audio work before I got a chance. And I thought it was time to move on. Um, sure. Sure. And at that point in my personal life, I was just very tired of living in Boston. Um, I'd lived there for 11 years by the time I finally left. Mm. And that was, that was enough for me. So Boston I started weather, sending, where is anyone out? And those roads, man. Boston, Boston weather and Boston attitudes. It was more the attitude than the weather. Although I don't, I, I don't miss the weather at all, but I definitely don't miss the attitude. Uh, mm. It just, it was making me, it was making me miserable. And I was sort of going through not quite a quarter life crisis. I, I, I moved away when I was, um, when I was 29. Uh, okay. And I just thought, you know, it's, I felt myself entering a new phase of my life. And uh, I didn't want it to be in Boston. I, I was like, just sort of unhappy about a lot of stuff and thought, I think I need a clean, I need a clean slate here. Uh, yeah. I, need, I need to get out of here. So I started I applying. To take on things. Yeah, yeah, some new scenery. Um, yeah. So I was applying to places all over the world, literally all over the world. I, you know, I, I was I was like, I'll go anywhere. I don't, I don't own enough stuff that I, that I need to bring it with me. No significant relationships. Uh, my family is great and they're, they're in the Northeast still, but, um, but they're supportive of my career and they kind of know the stuff that, that excites me. And so they would have, I think they would have been supportive if I went any, anywhere. The closest I got to moving abroad was I got really close. Maybe I shouldn't say really close. I, I got close, I would say to a job in, um, Shanghai, <laughs> oh. which I'm, which I'm glad I didn't take, uh, cause huh. that studio went under as well, but I think it would have been. 
it would have been a fun adventure and, a, yeah. and it would have been a fun, it would have been a fun experience. It was on a title. The, the, the studio doesn't exist anymore. Again, common theme. They're called spicy horse and they were founded by a guy named American McGee, which, oh, um, yeah. yeah, he, the game, the game they made was Alice return to madness or something like that. That was the game that, that they were working on when I, when I had applied there. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a cult following, and his whole thing has a cult following. But he he yeah based the studio in Shanghai, and I think what ended up happening why I didn't get the job was because it took like two weeks of back and forth with the the hire the person who's going to do the hiring to try to set up a time to do an interview, but they're on a twelve hour time difference, so we just kept missing each other. <laughs> and then eventually, I got an email that was like, "Sorry, we hired somebody," and I, and I thought, "Okay, well, you didn't give me a chance. We couldn't even schedule this stupid interview, but." It, it's fine, and and I'm happy that it that uh, that it didn't work out. And ironically, the guy they did hire a couple of years later, flash forward, a couple of years later, the guy that, that they did hire for that job was leaving and looking to find a replacement. And he reached out to me and said, "Hey, if you're still interested, I'd love to talk to you." And that guy, I think he's, I think he works at Valve now. He ended up moving to Seattle. Um, and I've never met him personally, but I'd love to. I think that'd be a funny conversation. I'd be like, "What was it like?" Uh, yeah, but at that point, I was didn't working- have. Yeah, yeah, but at that point I was already at ArenaNet, so you know it was a much better opportunity. Um, okay, so I uh, so I applied to a billion places, didn't hear back from almost anywhere except for ArenaNet, right? That was essentially the one place that gave me a chance, and um, I knew that I loved Seattle. Uh, my roommate in college was from there, and I and I'd been out to visit him in the summers a bunch of times, and. And he, and he had moved back after we graduated. So I knew that I would have somebody I was close with out there and it just kind of made sense. It all, it it felt, it felt right at the time. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and, and it was right. And it ended up being a good decision. So yeah, I moved to Seattle in 2010 to, to help them finish Guild Wars two. Uh, but again, strictly as a sound designer, um, just making, you know, and, and, and again, to talk about a rapid education, I remember coming into that and think like not trying to oversell myself to the audio director who was hiring me, mm-hmm. but being honest with him about like, Hey, I know how to make games. I, I've worked in games, but, but uh, you know, we don't do really difficult audio work at, at harmonics. So is that okay? And, you know, he, he understood. And I think he, he saw that there was potential there and gave me a chance to, you know, cut my teeth a little bit more on something a little more complicated Mm-hmm. And it was, it was great. You know, I just had to show up and, and start cranking out assets, but it was for pretty simple stuff like opening up a gate to a fence or sure. that casting a spell, you know, that, and that kind of stuff. Um, and not, what does it look like? Is it like going through libraries and picking sounds? Or are you making your own sounds? Like what's does that look like? It's a little of both, but oh. they, they wanted to, um, this is still their philosophy is, is to try to use, original source material as much as possible. So stuff that they've recorded. And at this point, you know, there's, they have a massive library of recorded sounds. Um, right. Right. But, but I think, you know, to differentiate it from any other game. Uh, yeah. It, you don't want to have important. that one like Wilhelm scream in there, right. That everyone knows from a thousand other properties. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes it's inevitable. Like I'm trying to think of an example, but um, you know, something like, uh, Something like a giant windmill, right? Like one of these sounds I worked on was a windmill, a huge okay. windmill. Yeah. And there's certain just large sounds that are difficult to replicate. So someone else might have already created a library of like groaning wood and metal and large gears turning that just kind of gets you started. You know, it's not like yeah. you just pop it in, plop it in one to one, but it's a good foundation that it's just like it'll save you some time and 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 we'll we'll incorporate that. But then you know we'll we'll go and record the sound of uh, a squeaky, you know, garage door or something and add that in there, you know? Sure. So I, I would say it was maybe 60, 40 or 70, 30 original sound to library sounds. Interesting. Um, Interesting. But yeah, as much as possible, they would try to record their own stuff. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, you just got to kind of mix it up and figure out where things sit in the frequency spectrum and pitch stuff down and pitch stuff up and turn it backwards and cut it up and you know all all those kinds of fun tricks um and then yeah like lay it in and see what works and adjust it and tweak it yeah cool cool i think in in my mind's eye and what i've seen from portrayals of this kind of work like on you know youtube or whatever the thing i like to imagine is like are the crazy things that people do to make sounds 
I think that's sort mm-hmm. of like the, the outsider romantic notion of what the job must be like. And yeah. a, a, it's, 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 so it's cool to hear your perspective on the breakdown and your experience there. But I just love to imagine like dudes in a garage just like crumpling shit and throwing it against the wall and recording it. And yeah, that yeah. Thing. Let's try that to is, do that again. That is 100%. I, you know, that... <laughs> it's not that's not all the time right because eventually yeah. you have to get in a computer and do a bunch of computer stuff uh but that's that's a big part of the job and that is what makes it most fun is is you know this is kind of like a, a an inside baseball sort of joke that sound designers have but it's like you just acquire stuff because if something breaks you're like you you wouldn't throw it out you're like well what can this do now that it's broken i'm gonna, uh-huh. I'm gonna try to break <laughs> it more you know uh there's there's there are some fun behind the scenes videos um, that, that arena net put together over the years that I'm in some of them back when I was doing sound design, but, uh, yeah, they, they never shy away from getting on the field, doing fun, weird stuff. We, uh, he wasn't the audio director at the time, but he is now. So Drew Katie, uh, wow. was the senior sound designer when I started and now is the audio director. He is a madman. Uh, and he, <laughs> um, he's like, a, he's sort of a maker and he's lo- loves crafting things before he got into games. He was like an upholsterer. So he's very wow. handy and create, he can create kind of amazing things for things like the, um, the footsteps for the char specifically. He actually, because he was an upholsterer knows how to work with textiles and materials. Uh-huh. He made uh-huh. essentially giant cat feet like slippers <laughs> And then, uh, and then recorded those like stomping around in, on dirt and gravel and grass and 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 those are the footsteps for for the char in the game. Still, oh my God. he also <laughs> built. Um, there, there's a video of this out there somewhere. He built, um, or he made essentially like a fireball. So he took like wick material, like rope material, mm. created a kind of giant ball. He too, he, he made a huge, a big one and a small one, but they sort of look like this, like they're in a, if this was a dome, if okay. you can see that. Yeah, so, yeah, uh, yeah. you know, kind of a wireframe sort of thing made out of this w- heavy wick material. Then he wrapped that in, in uh chicken wire um, to give it the shape and, and allow it to sort of maintain that sphere shape, uh-huh. dunked it uh-huh. in, in uh, like kerosene or flammable, some sort of flammable agent tied it to the end of a, a rope, lit it on fire, set up, set up an array of microphones in a circle and just, just swing it over his head. <laughs> and and the the sound, that sort of Doppler effect of that thing passing in front of the microphone going like, <laughs> that, that sound is all over Guild Wars. Uh, and not just for, for flame things. Like I, one of my jobs early on was to do the sound effects for the um, cinematics that happen in game. And the cinematic, uh, so there's like, there's the sort of limited cinematics that where the two, they, they, they don't do this anymore, but if you play the core game, yeah. when there's a sort of talking scene, there's like a background and then two characters will kind of drift yeah. in and talk to each other. And then, but then they're for things like some of the dungeons and a couple of key story moments. Like when you create um, a, a new character and then it runs you through the sort of uh, opening cinematic before it spits you out in the tutorial it sort of sets up the story of the world and and your place in and all that kind of stuff right right i I did i did those right and for any any time there was a scene transition where a camera would sort of do a wipe i would use those fire sound effects because just the perfect sound to just you know you're like uh and here in tyria we're doing this and 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 then divinity's reach and go like and and it's that it's that fireball sound effect It's, it's like everywhere in the game so that kind of stuff is really fun. That that was a very fun part of being strictly a sound designer is just like, when are we going to take a day off to go out into yeah, the woods yeah. and and do some fun stuff or the mad you know, scientist go... part of the job? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a lot of fun. I like that a lot. Cool. Um, okay. So where was I going? So okay. So I did that for a couple of years, right? And this is something I've talked about in a bunch of interviews, but I'll I'll say it again if anybody's seen this for the first time. Uh. As the game was getting ready to go out the door in 2012, um, one of my additional roles was also to do music implementation. Um, so mm-hmm. that was to take Jeremy Soul's music when he delivered it to figure out where it would go in the game, set up those things like I was talking about with with Titan Quest, where create the zones where the playlist would shift and set the parameters for when it would shuffle and things like that. Right. So it's it's not a very sophisticated music engine. Um, because it's kind of old and even now it's obviously even older, but uh, so it can't do, it can't do some of the crazy dynamic stuff that a lot of modern games do, but there was a little bit that you could do play around with some, some parameters to make, to keep it a little bit interesting. So I was in charge of that. 
And um, the game was sort of winding down in terms of production. And, you know, the nature of an MMO is that it's going to come out and then there's going to be more stuff constantly. So that means more music. There's always going to be music needs. Right. And they decided to change their approach to um, music for the game. So rather than have someone on contract who was over there, you know, and say, hey, we need 20 new tracks, uh, work up a contract, get those 20 tracks, then we're done. They, they thought it would be more valuable to um, have somebody in-house doing it, right? Hmm. Uh, and so then they, my, the audio director at the time asked me, can you, can you think of some people that we can reach out to? Maybe we'll hire somebody to sort of take over the music. Mm-hmm. And um, at that point I had written, I had written a couple of pieces of music that are in the game uh that that at, when it launched um was it or was it just one there there's an event that you do in in the human area uh where you have to like turn on you have to, you, you go into a cave you have to like steal a spider egg and you have to turn on these like phonogram or gramophone looking things that annoy these spiders so that the spiders go and like turn them turn the gramophones off but while they're doing that you go and sneak and steal their eggs so that so the design team was like we need some annoying music and i was like okay i can write annoying music so i wrote (laughs) so i wrote this annoying piece of music that's all like dissonant and in weird time signature and stuff uh and that was technically the first piece of music i wrote for guild wars um uh, and I think it, I think eventually we put it up on the arena net soundcloud page. It's up there. It's buried there somewhere. If somebody wants cool. to go digging. Um, anyway, so, uh, so I'd done a little bit of that. Um, I had implemented the music and I was tasked with finding the, repl- uh, you know, a new, a new composer. Um, and I did it sort of in earnest. Uh, and then I realized you that, do that, how do you find someone to do that? I mean, I know what eventually happened, but what well, I was just, just, games I played um, that I thought had great music that would work for this setting. You know, obviously it's, it's a fantasy game. So it need, and it, the sound of it is that big lush orchestral right. soundtrack. Right. So somebody who could write that kind of music and, and, you know, um, make it pretty. Uh, so the only, I forget exactly who I had jotted down, but it was based, based on my own experiences of playing games at the time. Like who, you know, who wrote music for a game that I've been playing that I think is great. Mm-hmm. And um, the only name that I can remember from the time is uh, Austin Wintry, of course, right? Like mm-hmm. he was he was sort of just exploded on, onto things. And I loved his music for Journey. And I thought, okay, well, he he might be good. But we never reached out to him. It was literally like a text file that I had. I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to I'm gonna come up with five to 10. And then, you know, we'll start figuring out how to reach out to them. And uh, then eventually I realized that, you know, this might be the opportunity that I had been looking for which was, you know, an opportunity to make a living as a musician, uh, which I had, I had fully ab- abandoned that idea, essentially, when I got into games. Um, so I went to my boss and said, uh, hey, you know, um, I'm a musician. I don't have any real or a way to prove to you that I can do this kind of music that the game requires, but... I can, I can hear it in my head, you know? So I, I think that if you just give me some time to figure out how to, you know, get that out, the technical side of creating that kind of music, getting it out of my head, uh, you know, and producing it to a high quality level using computer software, I think, you know, it might be a good fit. And uh, beyond the creative side of it, here are the other advantages that I have, which are, I know the game world really well. I've been immersed in it for two years now. I know the audio team really well and the tools that we use. Um, and then I know the broader team at the studio really well because we've been working together for two years. And I think those are all much stronger advantages than just hiring somebody fresh who's not familiar with the franchise, the sound of it, or the world of the game or the people making it. So, you know, what do you say? And he said, okay, I think that's that could be a good idea, but let me talk to my boss, who was the head of the studio at the time, Mike O'Brien. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, let's, let's see what he thinks. And then we'll, you know, we'll sort of come up with a plan and, and to my, to his credit and to my grad eternal gratitude, Mike thought that was a good idea. Um, but, uh, I still needed to, the Guild Wars two was not done yet. It wasn't out too, but it was close. Right. So, so they said, you know, we still need you to do your real job that we hired you for, but 
we'll sort of set you up to maybe try this out uh, and, and then we'll see how that goes. And they you know, bought me a new computer that was dedicated to um, writing music, bought me some software that I needed, bought me a keyboard, you know, some, some gear that, that was necessary. And then I just spent a lot of time, you know, learning and essentially teaching myself how to write for an orchestra oh. and, and, uh, and studying and studying and studying and studying and studying and uh, spending a lot of hours at the studio after the normal day was done. Um, just trying to get something that sounded good enough to put in front of them and say, Hey, here's, here's what I did. Um, and a lot of that stuff is bad, uh, you know, but, but, but it wasn't designed, you know, it's not like I was sitting down writing three minute pieces. I was just trying to, you know, copy, I would go to the library or, or go buy a score for some, you know, famous yeah. piece of music, try to recreate it in software to, you know, there's, there's, there's two sides of it. There's the learning traditional composition and orchestration, which I think go hand in hand. Mm. And then there's the technical side of it because the software is amazing, but it's not, it's not perfect. You still have to learn how to produce with this, this software to, to replicate right. as much as you can, the real thing. So it's kind of learning all this all at once. Um, and then eventually the first piece of music I felt good about was uh, a piece that was written for the Halloween festival. Oh. Um, so, right. So Guild Wars two came out end of August, 2012. Uh, there was some immediate sort of DLC that came out and then uh, October, uh, you know, was the first of the ho recurring Halloween festivals. Yes. And so I must have written that piece of music. It must have been sometime in September or something like that. Um, and I said, hey, here's this thing. You know, what do you think? And uh, and from that point on, um, you know, we never, never look back. Awesome. Yeah, that, that Halloween event is an important one in uh, in, 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 in Guild Wars. Uh, the, the community and the game, the tone that's set for the way that uh, the seasonal events respect the audience and the bar that it sets for quality, including things like music. Yeah, it's like, yeah. It's exciting to be a part of that. Yeah, it was. I, I would like, we had the opportunity to re-record some of the, those pieces live over the years because originally the for the first couple of years, it was all just sample-based um, yeah. versions. And then we had some, we we finally started doing some live music or live recordings with an orchestra. And I just thought we need to, we need to sort of up the quality of all the, all the post launch music. Um, so mm -hmm. let's go back and record some of that stuff live. And now that it's nice coming up to on. Be able to do. Uh, yes. I mean, it's a luxury. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm grateful that they, you know, have given me that opportunity and continue to give me opportunities to, to put high quality live music in the game. Um, now that it's coming up on 10 years, uh, and I, you know, I haven't even thought, well, I guess I thought about it a little bit over the years, but now I'm kind of like, this conversation has made me think uh, I should talk to them about, it, it's time for some new music, you know, for, for, for Winter's Day, got a couple new things over the years here and there, uh, but Halloween has been pretty much the same over the last 10 years, and I think it's overdue for at least a couple new tracks, you know, there's got to be some new stuff we can put in there. Because um, they put out, you know, they they always try to do something new to refresh it every year. So why not the music? Right. I love it. I should talk to them about that. Okay. I'll look forward to that. So uh, you roll the dice. You say, hey, maybe I'm the guy you're looking for. Yeah. And Mike O says, okay. I've I've noticed this in my my communications with a lot of the folks um, at ArenaNet, that there's just some, there seems to be, there seems to be a sort of really, and I'm sure this doesn't apply evenly across the board, right? Among teams and everything, departments. But I, I've just, I'm just noting and remarking at a, an attitude of, um, uh, it, it's a very, it seems like it's, it's, oh boy, I'm having a hard time putting words to this idea and I apologize. No problem. Uh, creative expression is encouraged. And maybe that's mm -hmm. a silly thing to say about someone who makes video games, but you hear horror stories about people just kind of, you know, printing out content or doing things that are, you know, you kind of describe uh, where you get to the point where it doesn't feel meaningful anymore. Um, but 
I've, I've heard a few different anecdotes of people who said, hey, I want to do this creative thing and wanted the banner of reading it. And it's been like, okay, go do it. Yeah, uh, I can't speak for everybody's experience, you know, because um, it's a big studio and a lot of people have moved through there over the years. Yeah, but yeah. I would say there's a lot, there's a decent amount of examples of, of you know, allowing people to uh, kind of prosper, right? They come up from whatever avenue, a junior person or whatever, whatever it is. And then, you know, um, when the time is right, uh, if they have an idea, it, it, it can be seen as valuable and on equal footing as as ideas of maybe veterans that, that are right. in similar positions. So things like, um, I mean, he wasn't new, but like when he when Super Adventure Box first came out, that was yeah. that was yeah. Josh Foreman's like side project that he was working on secretly, kind of like my music, right? And and then all of a sudden he showed it to someone and said, "Hey, I've been I've been working on this secret thing." And the studio was like, oh my God, what is this? This is amazing. We have to, <laughs> we have to put this in the game and make it a, a bigger thing. Uh -huh. um, and now of course that have became an annual event. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, there, there are examples of, of that sort of thing. Um, and even, you know, from, <clears throat> I, I don't like taking credit for it because she would have been a success uh, without my playing a part in it. But a similar thing happened with Lena uh, Chappelle, right. Or Lena rain, um, yeah. where she came up through QA there and then was a des uh, designer and um, content level designer. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and then created the bell choir event for the, for winter's day. Mm -hmm. And it was musical related. So she wrote a piece of music for it and came to me and said, what do you think? Can we put this in the game? And, and of course I said, yes. And I was blown away. I thought, you know, what are you doing? doing level design, which you're yeah. obviously good at, but, but, but you're, <laughs> you're also very good at writing music. So why don't we give you more opportunities to do that? Um, How cool that you had the chance to pass that on. I, again, yeah. I mean, I, I don't I don't like to take credit for it because her talent existed before I knew about it. And I think that she would have been a success no matter what. Sure. But, yeah. um, you know, I, but I, I don't like to people can get petty about these sorts of, th of positions they're in because, you know, game audio and then composition in game games is, is a very, very, very small pool of people relative to game development as a whole. Right. Yeah. So um, a lot of times it can be tough to kind of find your place at the table uh, and, and then people get protective and, and games are a little bit better about it. Um, I, you know, I live in Los Angeles and, and the home of movies and television production and, uh, people are a lot. People are a lot more protective about it in that world than they are in games, where uh, there's a lot uh, of pet pettiness and a lot of jealousy and backstabbing and trash talking behind people's backs and resentment. And and you know, to me, that's not a healthy way to live. Uh, and so I think that you know, you get games by nature of being younger, both average age and then as an art form. And then the nature of it is, you know, is most of the times is to bring joy and uh, to people and, and allow them to have fun um while telling stories it's a more fun industry and so why you know why can't we just be nicer why can't we, we can be the nicer form of entertainment compared to the kind of old guard so uh you know i don't like to think of myself as like well i am the guild wars 2 composer and all of you other people who want to write music need to go away because that position is filled right um and, and and I and I, I would hope that my track record sort of speaks to this, where I've always let the door be open for other people if if I feel like they can make a valuable contribution. And, and Lena was was one of the first people. Um, Stan Lepard was kind of the other one. He was sort of our fallback op. No, not fallback, but but when he, he was a little bit of the safety option. When when I said, "Can I take over the music?" They said, "Sure," uh, but you know that whole story about you know a trial run. And then also, why don't we find somebody who, you know, might be able to just write some stuff just in case it doesn't work out. And, and Stan was the first person I reached out to. He wrote a couple things for Halloween as well. Right. And then he wrote all of the music that was in the um, Lost Shores update, which is the one that came out in November of 2012. Right. Uh, so this, he was the first person w along with me to contribute some new music, but it was kind of like that just sort of set the precedent to, to always have it be a, a team effort. And I think it's important to maintain that to this day. That's beautiful. No, it's the, the best thing you can do 
when you've been given a privilege, like the privilege of the opportunity is to pass that on. I love that. Yeah. 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 And, and I, you know, it, beyond just giving people the, you know, some interesting work to do on, on cool projects. I, I think that, you know, I'm a veteran at this point, I've been in the game industry for 14 years. Right, uh, right. So, you know, even though I think that my best work is ahead of me, um, I hope it is, uh, you know, I get to look back now and see people who are uh, half my age or almost half my age who are just starting their journey. And I think there's an obligation to share as much as you can with them, even just in a simple com conversation. Um, because right. when I was their age, you know, uh, I would have, I would have gone crazy yeah. to talk to some, to talk to me now. Um, right. And like my friend Bryn gave me that opportunity to, to talk to the audio director at Iron Laurel. You know, I was 20, probably 24, 25 at the time mm -hmm. and just didn't know what I didn't know. And, and, uh, and he, graciously opened that door and allowed me to kind of learn a, a fraction of what I know now, but I, but that's how it starts. You know, everybody's got to start somewhere. And, and I think it takes people who are more senior to, to, to open the door and reach their hand out and say like, Hey, you can do this. Like, let me help you if you need it, but come, come with me, you know? That's cool. Yeah, getting started is so hard. And mm -hmm. you, you brought uh, Lena rain, like her, I think that, I think to date my wife who I played through all a part of thorns with, would still mm -hmm. say that that her music she did for uh like the golden city area of of heart of thorns uh is yeah. still her favorite it's still her favorite. yeah like, can you put that song on whenever we were playing guild wars together just have it going in the background yeah yeah her stuff is is um just instantly recognizable and memorable and and you know to this day still fan favorites uh and and deservedly so she's she's amazing Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So, uh, at this point you've, um, you become established as sort of, uh, the, uh, lead, lead composer, we can say on mm -hmm. Guild Wars 2 for Heart of Thorns. Um, how did things progress for you from there? Well, uh, let's see. Heart of Thorns was before Heart of Thorns, I should say, mm -hmm. um, you know, we I, there had been little bits and pieces of additional music. There was the, the holiday festival stuff. There yeah. was some stuff in Living World Season 1. Uh, and then, to me, the things took a leap for Living World Season 2. And that was the first opportunity we, right. we we got to do some live stuff. That was the first live orchestra we, we were able to put in the game. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, it, you know, in total, I think across all of Season 2, there was maybe 30 or 40 minutes of music in two kind of chunks <clears throat> over the course of a year. Um, and that was, that was really just me cutting my teeth. That was also a new experience for me uh, dealing with, you know, the, the realities of like with a computer, you have no limitations uh, except for the processing power of your computer. But like you can have a, technically it would be a, be a 500 piece orchestra, you know uh, that's what it would take to pull off what, whatever you're writing. Uh -huh. um, when, when you are limited to a practical number, in this case, we had about 62 or 64 musicians across okay. the whole orchestra, okay. uh, you know, that that's different. Uh, it's, it's, uh, some, you know, you, all of a sudden you have real limitations and, and things like we only have two days to record all this stuff. So we have to like, you know, do it quickly and all that kind of stuff. So anyway, living world season two is kind of where that started. Um, Heart of Thorns what was the was, conversation like about starting to do live music. Did you bring it up? Was it brought up internally? Who, like how how did that get started? Yeah, I, I was the one that brought it up. So what happened was um, this would have been 2013, somewhere around there. I uh, I became friends, or was just following them on social media. I, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was. I think I st I was following the so the twitter account for wildstar um wow. which was developed by carbine Enter entertainment another studio that no longer exists uh and another game that does, no longer exists but um you know at the time ncsoft the parent company of arena net mostly exists in asia the, they're kind of you know they're a publisher on a massive scale comparable to activision or ea yep. but but the majority of their business is is focused on asia and they owned at the time 
two Western studios. They owned ArenaNet and they owned Carbine. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so I was following Wildstar. Um, I just sort of knew about its development. I think maybe the audio director had come to Seattle and they'd done kind of an information exchange with us. And we just sort of met them and talked about what they were doing, cool. uh, asked him what he was doing. So uh, I was following them and then I saw them post on, I guess it was on Instagram. Um, yeah, it was on Instagram. Um, I saw them post a picture of a recording session with a live orchestra. And I'm like, wait a second. You know, if you trace this back, the same people are paying for their to make their game that are paying to make our game. And yet we have all this sample based stuff and they're in a studio in Los Angeles with a hundred piece orchestra. We should be doing that. Um, yeah. So I went to my boss and said, have you seen this? Like what are, what's going on here? Uh, and you know, there's all sorts of complications about, about why that happened and where their funding was coming from and blah, blah, blah. But um, uh, it did, it did, it started the conversation. So then um Drew, Katie, and I flew down to LA for their final uh, week of recording sessions for that score to sit in in the studio and, and see, just kind of observe the process and hear it and kind of make the case for why we should be doing this. And it was, you know, it blew my mind. Like we we were at, they recorded that one all over LA in a couple different scoring stages, but the, the sessions we sat in were at Warner Brothers, mm -hmm. um, which is a beautiful scoring stage. The legacy of that place is amazing. I mean, the scores that have been done there over the last 75, 80 years is, is kind of incredible. And, and, you know, they had the same people in the room that play on all your favorite movies if they're recorded in LA. And it just sounded so good. And, and um, so we went back to Arena and I said, we, well, we got we to gotta do this. Um, I don't, you know, it's not cheap. <clears throat> and the, the soundtrack to Wild Star cost a lot of money that we didn't necessarily have. But but they weren't the only option. LA is not the only option. So I started exploring a little bit, found a company um, that uh, does music, music contracting with orchestras in Central and Eastern Europe. And those are much more affordable options. And then also, you know, these are sort of legal aspects to it that I did. Again, I didn't know at the time, but if you record in the US, especially in Los Angeles, you have to deal with unions and there's minimum times that you can book it. It has to be, there's minimum lengths that you can book sessions for. Right. All that sort of stuff. And we, we just didn't, we didn't have the resources or the need for some epic week long recording session. We just kind of needed a little bit here and there. And then because it was the living world stuff, you know, it's bite-sized chunks of content spread out over several months. Yeah. So it's like, we might need 10 minutes of music one month and then 15 minutes a month later or two months later. Uh, so we found this a company um, that uh, could accommodate that at our price and our kind of needs, and uh, and they were working with a the, the, all the Living World season two stuff was done with a, a group in um, a t it's called Frankfurt. It's a city in Germany. It's not the Frankfurt that everyone knows. There's two Frankfurts in Germany. Um, okay. Yeah, so this this is a smaller one. Um, uh -huh. They're, they're, de they're delineated by the rivers that they're on. So the main, the Frankfurt that everyone knows is called Frankfurt Alm Mainz. Mainz, I think, M-A-I-N-Z. Uh, and it's on the river Mainz. Um, and then the one that we recorded in is on the river Oder, O-D-E-R. So it's Frankfurt on der Oder is what the, okay. is what the, but Frankfurt on the Oder is what it means in German, the Oder River. And that one is in the former East. It's kind of like right on the border of Poland. It's about 45 minutes East of Berlin. Um, Small town, I mean, a small sleepy suburb, but they just happen to have a really great orchestra there that, that records in this beautiful old concert hall that was built in like the 1300s or something like that. Um, that was a church and has been since converted into a, a concert venue. So um, anyway, we recorded there the season season two stuff. Um, and it just, you know, to me, it's still that's some of my favorite stuff that I've ever written for the game, even though it was a long time ago. Yeah, uh, but yeah. it was it was a good sort of uh, preview for what Heart of Thorns would be. I think we recorded with the same group in. Is that true? Yeah, we recorded with the same group in in that same venue uh, for Heart, for Heart of Thorns, but that was a much much bigger production because I think that was seventy something minutes of of live music um, that all had to be written and orchestrated before we went over there, rather than kind of piecemeal. Uh, but at that point, I'd sort of proven the value of 
live music uh, and how much better it sounded than even the best, you know, fake stuff that's in the game. I mean, Jeremy Soule's kind of stock and trade is it was or is his ability to produce incredibly high quality music using only samples. And I think a lot of people don't even realize that the majority of his music is not live. Um, I didn't realize that until I, was, I watched an interview you gave where you talked about his setup and what went into it. That fascinates me. Yeah, yeah, he was really good. And especially he's been good at it at a time when it had been, it, the, the technology was less democratized. Like, it, you know, to produce stuff that sounded that good was very, very, very difficult when he was kind of coming up. And that doesn't mean he's he's an amazing composer and can write for a live group, you know, just as well. But um, all at least for Guild Wars, all the, all of that stuff is all virtual instruments. Um, and it sounds amazing, but it's just like there's something about real people in a room just resonating together and harmonizing in the way the way the air is moving. And it's just special. So um, yeah. and it, it in the long run, even though it's a little more expensive, it takes less work like. I can write a piece of music that the virtual version of it sounds not that great, but it doesn't matter because it's just to sort of get a feel for it, get approval, say that this is good. Then you go through the whole cycle of, you know, cleaning it up and turning it into actual score on paper. And then you just put it in front of these people who've spent their, they've dedicated their lives to mastering their instruments. Right. And, and by the second take, it sounds perfect and flawless and gives you chills that even the most, well-produced digital version of that that might take you a week or two weeks to perfect it just blows that out of the water so um there's that the must season be an incredible two. moment sorry that must be an incredible yeah. moment like the first time you heard your your compositional work for Guild Wars 2 being played live that must have been an amazing moment it was and it was also unbelievably stressful uh because oh. I, because i had never done it before right and so i i went to germany to sit in on the sessions because I wanted to be there for it. Yeah. And I'm just like, my stomach was just in knots because I'm like, I know how much this is costing. And if we don't get it right, I've, I've blown my opportunity because we, we wasted so much money and time. Uh, and fortunately it ended up being fine. There, there are things that I would do differently that when I hear it now, I'm like, okay, this, I, I this is, this is the writing of an inexperienced composer. Right. So things like, the ranges of certain instruments are not their best range, both high and, excuse me, and low. Um, or there's not enough variety to keep things interesting, right? It's just a sort of flat where it's like one thing is carrying it the whole way rather than saying the strings get it for a little bit and then the brass picks it up and then the wood, you know, just More dynamic, mix, yeah. mixing it up. But that that's, that's, the, uh, that's just my inexperience showing. Um, but, uh, so I was so nervous about that stuff, but the, the orchestra, of course, is patient and they're happy to be there. Um, you know, whether or not they like your music is a different story, but they're getting paid to be there and they like that, I'm sure. Uh, and and then they're just so good that they they are a safety net. They will save you. Um, uh, and they've and they've, they've they've saved me many times. Um, and then eventually you just get better at it. You learn from your mistakes and try not to make those mistakes anymore. But, yeah, it, it's the. You know, a lot of my time is spent in this room alone, um, just kind of daydreaming. And those moments of when we finally get a chance to do something live, whether I'm there for it or whether I'm just monitoring it here remotely, that part is always magic. And I, I, even though I still get a little bit nervous before every session, I never get tired of those moments when it just comes to life. Comes it's just life. really wow. special. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess. Uh, so Heart of Thorns was really what kicked things into overdrive for Guild Wars. Um, right. And then, you know, after that, there, there isn't always money or time to do a live session. So there's some living, a lot of the living world stuff tends to be virtual because of the nature of how it needs to get produced. Right. I've tried to incorporate more live elements, even if it's just percussion or something or, or hiring a single soloist to play something live over it. Um, but then, yeah, the next opportunity to do something live didn't come until Path of Fire, which is a couple of years later. What's the process of like, so as as a as a player of Guild Wars Two, right? As someone who's in the fan community, I, I see content show up, you know, for let's say like Living World content every like every quarter, roughly, and it shows up with all this new music, all these new places in the world to see, all this new story to experience. 
how how far ahead of a release like that do you uh, start working on the music that goes into it? It can it can vary quite a bit, um, but you know usually several months. You know uh, because a lot of that content is in development from the other teams. You know maybe even like a year before it actually comes out, but that's yeah. from a design standpoint or an art standpoint. Um, audio, it, by the nature of <clears throat> just the way we have to work is one of the last things that, that happens because we kind of need everybody else to be done before we come in. But we the, we try to be involved in conversations along the way so that they don't forget about us, which you know is another problem that all audio people face across the industry. Mm. Um, so yeah, I, I will typically be involved, you know, anywhere from a, a couple months to six, eight months, sometimes a year. That's that usually with the expansion stuff, it's that, you know, the scope of it is so much greater that that I'll be working on that quite a bit ahead of time. Living world stuff, you know, minimum a few months, but uh, somewhere three to eight months, I would say is probably average. Okay. Interesting. And um, are there... Have there been moments, um, the thing that I'm kind of drawn to thinking about, and maybe there's some more storytelling for you to do before we get there. Um, I, I actually tweeted this out earlier this week because I was thinking in myself about what, what about your music has really affected me personally? Like how, mm -hmm. how has it actually landed with me? What, 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 what can I really remember when I think about it? And for me, I went to a moment in, uh, we were just talking about Heart of Thorns and season three and Path of Fire happens. And then season four is actually a moment in season four where I kind of wanted to talk to you about, but is there, is there sure. more you want to say about like Path of Fire and everything about that before I asked you that question or would that be a good moment to jump in with that? What do you think? Uh, yeah, go for it. If Path of Fire stuff comes up or it'll let it come up organically. Great. Great. Yeah. So um, it's uh, the, the the Thunderhead Peaks release of, of Guild Wars 2 Living World. Um, mm -hmm. It is called All or Nothing, I believe, is the, sort of the, the title of the release. Yeah. And I grew up uh, always sitting in my mom's choir, okay? My parents mm -hmm. dragged me to church every single, every single weekend, and I'm always, in, I'm always in the choir. Me and all my younger siblings, I was the oldest. My mom was a choir director for ever since I, I was, you know, old enough to remember anything. She was always a choir director, and I was always singing in her church choirs. And so when I heard the choir, so setting the stage for people who are listening, what's happening in Guild Wars 2 in this, in this moment is you have decided as, uh, you know, your dragon's watch, your party who's kind of dealing with this dragon problem in Tyria, you have to realize that you need to confront Kralkatoric because he is powering up and he is dangerous. And Kralkatoric's the big, the big, like, he's the guy um, yeah. implicated with uh, all these legends of storytelling, Glint and Oreen and uh, uh, just the Elder Dragon threat. And this is a scary thing to do, but you have this sort of baby dragon who is the granddaughter of, of Kralkatoric on your side and she has had a premonition about her death. And in that premonition, which is revealed in the previous story chapter, that when she confronts Kralkatoric, she will die, no matter what she does. So what you do in this story, this all or nothing release, is you have this kind of uh, abstract story experience where you're bonding with Orin before you go into this, into this final confrontation, which you don't know how it's going to go. So after this bonding moment, you go through a portal and then you land in Thunderhead Keep. So this enormous dwarven fortress on the top of an icy mountain. And as you arrive there, all lifting at your ears, you hear this choir in the distance and it starts to rise and rise. Orin, Orin, dragon full of light, guide us through the night. And it's just this, it's this moment that even, even thinking about it, like, uh it it grabbed me man it just got mm -hmm. me um so i i wanted to ask you about that um the zephyrite sure. choir and 
there are a few other moments from that release that, that for me for me showed me video games doing a thing with music that I didn't know they could do. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, that, that release, you know, that's a special one for me. That that's, that's like a, a high watermark of, of sorts. Um, that I would love to do more stuff in that vein. <clears throat> the, uh, what happened, what happened with that one was, let's see. So the Zephyrites first came about, um in a, another living it wasn't it wasn't part of a season right. or kind of was was but but the uh they had their own um festival release that i think I, it comes back every year festival now I think. four wins i think yeah, yeah yeah so they were gonna do that they brought it back recently yeah i don't think it's been back every year but they, they have brought it back somewhat recently um so they wanted they they wanted uh the zephyrites to have excuse me a um a song that they sing and uh there is like part of it is incorporated into the background music but if, if you walk around there's npcs that sing this right uh, oh. zephyrite song that they got the actual actors to do and none of them sang it in the same key uh, which is really funny um <laughs> but uh anyway so there's there's technically a song sort of associated with them and, and they at least they have this kind of musical lineage and then um we never really took that anywhere beyond that release uh and then when the all or nothing stuff was happening or season four, so Cameron, Cameron Rich, uh, designer, um, was in charge of that, uh, encounter, that final encounter and instance. And Cam, I think is, um, you know, he's a musician, uh, and, and has an interest in music and, and an appreciation of it. So he was the one that came to me early on, or, or maybe he pitched the idea of the team and then it sort of filtered its way to me about um, <clears throat> making music a bigger part of that release. And that, you know, there would be this sort of group of acolytes uh, or monks or whatever you want, whatever term you want to use, not necessarily worshipers, but, but um, people who had an affinity for Aureen and were seen as sort of pr protectors of her and, and yeah, priests, I guess is maybe a good word. Um, and, and that they would, they, that the final encounter would be, they would sort of unite their voices in harmony and channel that into, into a, a kind of energy that would be used to defeat Kralkatoric. Right. So, um, so, so choir had to be a part of the music both the background music and part of the encounter. Um, and then I thought, well, I mean, it's probably his idea, but uh, to have them have a song that they would sing, that this is like, this is their hymn that they sing for Orion, yeah. and then derive the musical elements that they would use to kind of create this source of energy from that piece of music, right? It has to start with something. I'll just write a piece of music and then we'll pull what we need from that. So, um, and because it was a choir, you know, I'm like, there'd been choir in, in the game before, but it's always right. fake, right? It's always samples. And it's either just doing oohs and ahs as a pad layer, essentially. Um, or, you know, it's very common to just have, there's plenty, 10 billion choir sample libraries out there that do kind of gibberish syllables that sound vaguely like Latin or whatever. And um, you can just kind of mash the chord out and it'll sound, you tuck it way in the background and it'll sound like they're saying something in a language, but it's mostly gibberish or it is completely gibberish. Um, and we've had some of that, like this choir on the heart of thorns theme yeah. that you, that comes in the end and that that's all fake and they're not saying anything. It's just, it's just there to amp it up and adds an extra layer of, of intensity to it. I would love to do it with a real choir. Um, I'd have to write some lyrics. Uh, but, um, Anyway, so I was like, well, this is a chance to do something more interesting and, and do less of just like block chords that are just mimicking what the orchestra is already doing, like have counterpoint and have call and response and do all the things that are cool with choirs that you, you can't do unless you have the real things so that you try to you try to mask the limitations of the software uh, by not pushing it to what you could do with the real ensemble. So yeah, so I went to the studio and said, "Hey, if we're going to do this event based on a choir, we need to we need to hire a real choir." Um, and uh, and so that nothing nothing else in that that in that season is live um, except for the choir in that event. Uh, so it's all virtual instruments except for the choir stuff. And then um, this was sort of a it's better ask for 
forgiveness than permission kind of scenario where I'm like, all right, I, it's going to need words that they'll probably want to filter that through the narrative department. But every time I try to do something like that, no slight against them, but there's just a lot of bureaucracy and I need to just get it done. I need, you know, cause I have other things that I need to derive from this piece of music. So I'm just going to write it myself. I have a background in songwriting and, okay. and, uh, you know, I'm just going to write some words that rhyme and feel good and, and are, and work well when you set them to music yeah. um, okay. and hopefully capture the spirit of what this character is about and what this instance is about and what this encounter is about. Um, unfortunately, you know, it, it worked. Uh, they, they, they were into it and they had no notes about it. Um, and then, and then I had to kind of, yeah, I've never written for a choir like that um, previously. And, and really since it's really the only time I've ever had the opportunity to, to work with a, with a, a group, but it, it worked out great. I mean, I love, I love choral music, I, you know, tying back into what I said at the beginning, one of my favorite, groups of all time is the beach boys. I love the beach boys. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I think people who aren't fans maybe only see them as kind of, it's like, well, it's like, I'll just surf music. It's all about girls and cars. And yeah, it is, but that's not, or a lot of it is not, not all of it, but they're the hits that people know are all about that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. but that's not, what's interesting about it. It's, it's the production from a studio perspective, all the instruments of all the, you know, instrumentalists. And then of course it's their voices, right. They just, they are unbelievable. And Brian Wilson is this, genius level arranger um and, you know has such a profound understanding of of how to put voices together so that was you know my early indoctrination and then when i when i got into college i got really into um this is a luxury we don't have anymore but right up the street from berkeley at the time was uh the let's see what what it started off as tower records again mm -hmm. defunct and then it became a virgin mega store another defunct uh retail outlet, but, you know, a, a massive uh, music store with that sold mostly some other stuff. But it was, you know, this was kind of the last dying gasp of people buying CDs and physical media. Okay. Uh, so, and my time off between periods uh, at, at school, or if I had a day off or whatever, or at the end of the day, I would just, it was literally a block away. So I just walk up there and wander around and just walk out with a stack of CDs. Um, and I would kind of, it's still probably to this day, the most curious I've ever been about music. I would just take a chance on a lot of things. Well, and cover, album cover, just like, this is a cool name for a band. Nice art. Yeah. Yeah. Or, you know, if there was a recommendation from the staff and then, you know, again, this is a luxury that we don't get, you know, now, now we're beholden to algorithms telling us what we, what it thinks we might like. But, you know, back then you walk into a record. I mean, you can still do this in, in some, if you're in a city that has a cool sort of music store record shop, you can still do this, but this was a giant, you know, national chain. Um, but uh, so it's, you know, a lot more foot traffic than just hipsters going to record stores. Mm -hmm. So I, anyway, I'd go in there and and there was always music playing on the PA. And then sometimes you would, it would be what the staff had put on, they had chosen to put on. And they would, um, you know, at the counter, they would have a little display. It's like, you're now listening to this and there would be a CD. And so just to get you to impulse buy something. And I bought a lot of music that way that, uh, that I still to this day love. And one of the things that I heard was um, a suite by a composer named Mort Morton Lordson, right? Who, if you if you know choral music, uh, he's like this titan of choral music. And and I encourage if you don't know who he is, I encourage you to look him up because he writes okay. unbelievable, incredible, beautiful music. Uh, I would say that you know, this is I, I'm not an expert in modern choral concert music, but like you know, nowadays everybody who's into that kind of thing knows who Eric Whitaker is, right? Eric Whitaker is this like superstar of choral music. This guy sort of his, uh, I don't even know. I would say they, there's probably an influence there, but but he is maybe the the pro progenitor of, of that type of sound. Very, okay. very beautiful and very lush. It's not like dissonant modern sort of composition, but but yeah. incredibly complex harm, harmonic language that he uses. Um, and just pretty, it's just so pretty. I mean, the human voice has, you know, human voices and harmony is one of these amazing, beautiful things. Yeah. So anyway, it was playing a piece called um, Lux, Lux Eterna. So L-U-X, it's Latin, right? For eternal light. L-U-X-A-E-T-E-R-N-A. -E -E um, and I just remember thinking like, what is this? Because I'd never heard of, I'd never heard choral music that wasn't just, you know, purely kind of sacred music like Bach right. or whatever, just church related stuff. Um, this seemed like there's definitely a spiritual quality to it, but it doesn't, it's not, you know, derivative of 
of church music, you know, Euro- European church music of the 15th to 19th century, right. um, which of course is also beautiful. And, and there's, you know, amazing stuff that was written in, but this was, this was a modern composition. And, and I just, I was like immediately drawn to it. And I picked up that CD. And if there's any sort of influence that I might have in my choral writing, which is very, very limited, it's just that I just wanted to get a fraction of that type of sound, um, you know, and, and see if I could push myself a little bit. So then I sat down. Yeah. Yeah. And so this, so that's what, but there's, but but with that particular piece, the Orin dragon full of light piece, um, there's elements of Gregorian chant in there, right? Because it starts off with those low male voices, just kind of holding the, the, it's not really a drone, but, but it's very sort of simple harmonic movement. Right. Um, and, uh, and, but it gets more complex as the piece goes on and we introduce the, the female sections. Mm-hmm. And then at the end, there's a hundred percent a beach boys moment at the end. There's this like big swell where they like, it's that final kind of uh, uh, portamento oh, yeah. swell. Yeah. I mean, that's like, yeah hundred percent of beach boys lift. And I'm like, I gotta, I gotta put it in there. Um, oh, yeah. 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 But, but uh, you know, they just, the, the group that sang it, we did that in Salt Lake city um, and Salt Lake city, of course uh, has, you know, uh, a large Mormon community and, and there's, you know, they, they're famous for having the Mormon tabernacle choir, which is this massive, massive, massive choir. Um, and so we were, we were able to, you know, get some people that sing in that group. Uh, it wasn't a very large ensemble. I, I can't remember it was maybe 14 or 16 people. It wasn't a lot, mm-hmm. but you know, you write it well and they sing it well, and then you double it and stack them on top of each other and put some reverb and, and then it sounds huge. And, uh, and they just did an unbelievable job. And, and I would love the opportunity to go back and, and do more with them because I would like to write something that has a little bit more harmonic movement um, uh, and just see what I can do, you know, because they, that they sang that piece beautifully, but it's, it's not the most challenging choir piece. Um, sure. And that doesn't mean it's, that doesn't mean it's bad. It's, it's exactly what it needs to be, but I, I'd like to, you know, just like with my orchestral writing, you try things, you see, okay, before you dive into the deep end, you got to like, you know, step in the shallow end, get you get adjusted to the temperature of the water, right. you know what I mean? And then, and then you go out into the deep end. Yeah, get oriented in the space. Make sure you know yeah. what you're doing. Make sure you're reflecting some quality of what inspired you to get interested in it in the first place. And then you're there. Yeah. Like, okay. Yeah. We're here. We're solid. Let's like, what's the next thing? Totally. Beautiful. Yeah. Well. So anyway, thank you for your very kind words, and I'm glad you appreciated it. And and, and uh, I hope that I mean that feels like so long ago now. I feel like we're sure. overdue for putting, for putting more stuff like that in the game. We'll see. Yeah. Gosh, I would love that. I would love that. And I also remember being so impressed, like, um, I, I don't know how this was pulled off, uh, but uh, you mentioned that there's like a, a, a burst of, of, of the, the choral audio that's used in like, as like a dragon attack, right? In the final confrontation. Yeah. And I know you mentioned that like the, the audio engine is, um, the music engine is not very sophisticated in terms of like dynamically playing things, but I was surprised in that confrontation. And I saw this when I went, when, when I went, went back and reviewed the footage as well from playing it in the past that uh there's like the kind of background like combat music kind of percussive da, 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 da. and yeah. somehow somehow the way that was done and when the moment comes when you actually have to use the choir burst like the, the sonic burst whatever it's called it it really hung together it didn't it didn't feel like you were interrupting the the uh, musical sort of through line. It felt like you were hitting a crescendo and then it was sort of decrescendo and continue. Yeah. And that combined with the narrative stakes combined with, you know, the, the, the way that the, the encounter was designed is, is this for me, a high point of mm. what this kind of medium can do in this kind of uh, setting. And it's yeah. really gorgeous. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. We, um, it's been a while, but in terms of the way that was implemented, you know, we, we, we pushed it as far as I think it's capable of going. There's probably easier ways to do it in a, in a more modern, sophisticated audio engine. Sure. Uh, but there's, there were three separate pieces of combat music for each level of intensity. And then there was a separate swell that would get, tri- like you would sort of, the, the beam would kind of charge up and would play that swell 
and then it was we you know you just have to experiment with the timing so it would play that as a, as a separate kind of stinger and then the blast would happen and that would kind of cover up the transition between the fade out of the stinger and then the start of the combat track yeah. Um, so yeah, it's a little bit of, it's a little bit of smoke and mirrors, but all games have that even, even more sophisticated ones. Um, mm-hmm. and it's like, if it works, it works. And you, you know, your ears don't, you just, you have to play test it a bunch and test things and say, no, this needs to start half a second later and then it'll be fine. And uh-huh. you know, that, that was the best we could do at the time. Yeah. Well, I thought that was awesome. Uh, the magic is in, is in the reception of it, right? Yeah, exactly. And you know, like I said, uh, even the most incredibly well-polished, you know, naughty dog type game or whatever, there's all sorts of trickery and hacks and things that, you know, they don't, that uh, if it were to be exposed, you'd be like, oh my gosh, like yeah. this is, yeah. this is the premier studio making, you know, this game of the year type thing, but it's sometimes <laughs> you're doing what? <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, it's the same thing with, uh, you know, it's the same thing with movies and TV shows. It's all, it's all, it's all magic tricks. You know, it's just how, how it's executed. Um they're all tricks. Sure, sure. You know, uh, after sharing the anecdote with you and hearing you describe the process, it, it, it occurs to me that it must be very different having your having your music be received in the in the video game medium compared to other ways of doing music. Um, I wonder, like, do you like seek out people's opinions on music? Do you watch? anyone who streams or plays the game like how how do you how do you get a sense of of how the work is being received or is that not as important to you have that dark, um that you know it's it's unavoidable because you know you just we're all online all the time and and people like to share their opinions online uh you don't say and, yeah and so you know i don't have like a massive kind of uh following i would say twitter is probably the biggest one i've got and it's pretty modest compared to a lot of people um but you know i engage with people on there um and uh, i read reddit you know um i don't read the forums so much because they're kind of a mess to navigate uh but but you know reddit is kind of an unofficial forum um and uh you know i read all the opinions good and bad um and the bad ones don't bother me so much anymore you know when i was more sensitive about my work early on and and felt like it was kind of the emperor had no clothes and i was just waiting for people to call call me out um the 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 bad opinions would make me feel kind of bad uh, but i think that's true of anybody and it's just cuz i was overly sensitive and if somebody if somebody verbalized something that i was feeling about my own work I would say, oh my God, this is like the rights. They're so everybody thinks it's fraud. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but um, you know, I don't I don't feel that way so much anymore. And not not out of kind of ignorance or arrogance, but um it's just I know what I'm good at and I know uh, you know, that I know that I know that there is a silent majority uh that that doesn't go on the internet and, and shout their opinions, good or bad, right? And 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 I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of fans in person over the years at different events and things. And most cool. people are so kind and, and um, you know, w- whether or not maybe I'm wrong and maybe there's a silent majority that's like, I can't stand McLean's music. It sucks so bad. When is he going to go away? Cool. And uh, you know, even if that is out there, it's not worth, it's not worth focusing on, right? The people right. that, so, you know, in terms of who has to be happy with the music, well, I have to be happy first. Yes. And for the most part, I've been happy with the majority of the stuff. Not, not all of it. Sometimes you're like, well, that could have been better, but um, I don't really think I've done anything that's like overtly bad uh, that I'm deeply embarrassed by that I want scrubbed from the record. Um, if there is bad stuff out there, it's not public. I've def- there's definitely some, there's some things where I've been like, we can't put that out uh, <laughs> that I hope that I hope never get out there. But um, oh boy. Uh, and then, you know, so I've got to be happy with it. And then the studio has got to be happy with it. And now I've got a decade with them of, you know, of trust built up with them and a legacy that, that they are happy with it. Um, and then the fans of course have to be happy with, they have to feel like it's appropriate there. There is a level of relinquishing ownership over this thing, not just the music, but the game itself, Mm. because we are sustained as a studio and as an IP by the people who buy the game and play it regularly and have been playing it for 10 years. Um, So there, you know, you have that, that's also an important element and, and uh, you know, pe- they have to be happy with it as well, but it, it doesn't have to be all or nothing. No pun intended. Um, it just has to be, you know, the majority of them appreciate it and say, this is appropriate for our game that we love. 
both from the people that make it and the people that play it. And I think that, you know, I, I think we've kind of, I think we've hit that mark there. There we've missed it a few times. Um, speaking of path of fire, you know, just the, the, the general opinion of that is that it's not the strongest soundtrack among the expansions, Really, which I, I, yeah, I mean, you know, it's not that it's bad, but, but I think, I think heart of thorns made such a powerful impression on people right. that right. this is sort of the sophomore slump. And I think it was probably inevitable that it would disappoint some uh, people because it's so, so different. I think there's a lot of things about it that are much better than heart of thorns. Um, but you know, there's some things that maybe aren't, uh, but, I, but because I'm the one that kind of <clears throat> always trying to trudge forward and put, put my best work out there. I always think that the new thing is always the best thing. Cause otherwise, <laughs> otherwise I'd be really disappointed or very stagnant about it. So I'm always like, well, it's new. So it's better because I've done that and I've yeah. learned all these yeah. lessons and after the fact, and I've applied them to this new thing. And then the next thing is going to be even better. But um, when you're receiving it, you know, uh, people can take it differently. And, and, I, and I've been the same way, you know, with fans that I, uh, bands that I like or studios that make games that I like. And, you know, you know what I mean? So I know what it's like as a consumer. They change creatively over time. And you're like, oh, man, like I love them when they were doing this. Yeah, this exactly. I'm not really resonating with as much. But I, I really respect what you're describing. Like, I, I think I read somewhere that when, when you create something, you're also sort of creating yourself along the way. Mm. And the result of that is that the person who makes the next thing is not really the same person who made the thing before. Like you've changed in some way, you've progressed, you've, yeah. uh, you know, grown. Um, and I, I love that process. You know, one of the things that jumps out at me in terms of like, so I'm trying to think like, what's really different about these soundtracks qualitatively? Um, cause I, I've loved all of them and I love the path of fire soundtrack, but one thing I can think of is the, the difference in the title themes. And mm -hmm. it's interesting having played End of Dragons. I've loved the, the themes for End of Dragons. And I think I even made a tweet about it like some time ago when I first heard the End of Dragons theme and I compared it to the Heart of Thorns theme. Um, yeah. And I didn't compare it to the Path of Fire theme. I was like, oh, what, what's, what was different about that? So I went back and listened to it. And um, it's a much more soundscape-y type experience. And... I think I heard you talk about in an interview something about your interest in doing more soundscapey type work. Um, maybe I'm misremembering that, but I wonder if you could comment on like the evolution of the main themes of Guild Wars as well while you've been involved. Sure. Um, well, you know, the so obviously the Guild Wars 2, or the original theme for Guild Wars 2, I mean, there's the Guild Wars 1 theme, which is similar to the Guild Wars 2 theme, but Guild Wars 2 theme, I think the core one that Jeremy wrote uh, yeah. is, is very, is very effective, right? Because it's, it comes in right away, you know, kind of intense, like hits you really hard, very memorable melody, very simple. I mean, in musical terms, it's like stupid simple. It's just like uh, up and down a minor scale. It's like not that, not that interesting if you strip out just the notes, right. but the way it's set is what makes it interesting. And the simplicity of it is what makes it catchy um, and, and effective. So it's a great theme. And I've had to incorporate that, you know, and manipulate it and, and uh, hint at it in so many, so many, so many, so many ways over the years. And the simplicity of it makes it uh, adaptable in a very nice way. Um, so, you know, with Heart of Thorns, I thought I'm, I'm good at writing catchy melodies, right? For whatever deficiencies I might have real or imagined as a orchestral composer, um, there's elements that I'd like to get better at. There's elements I don't really care about, um, of that type of doing that type of writing, but there's one thing I know I'm good at, which is writing melodies. I could just write and, and I attribute that to my background in bands and my interest in pop music and the Beatles and the beach, but you know, that's like, that's yeah, what that's yeah. all about is, is simple and catchy. And I, and that's what I like. So with Heart of Thorns, but that, that one was a struggle because that was really the first time I'd written like a, a theme. Like this is the first thing you're going to hear. It has to sum up the whole experience and you have to be able to hear it over and over and over again. Um, all over and all. yeah, and not just for Guild Wars. Like you think about the great themes that we all know, Star Wars and, and uh, you know, Star Trek and uh, even, you know, now like the Avengers, right? The, these things that are really powerful that these titans of of the kind of film media uh, composing world um, have given us. And and it, it, I was like, I intimidated myself on that one. And, and that one went through so many iterations. And I did a, I did a live stream, this is years ago, but I did, I did a live stream where I kind of ran through every version of it. 
um, as it evolved. Uh, and, and I just remember being such a struggle to get to the final version. And I still am like, people love it. And I think it's good, but I don't think it's great. And I think it could be better, but I always think that, right? So I, I would I would love a chance to kind of revisit it. I, I never will because it is what it is and it's not worth changing. It's just about moving forward. But where it ended up is fine, but I don't think it's I don't think it's stellar. Um, OK, but uh, and, and you know, an example of that is like in the in the beta weekend, the, the uh, sort of original beta for Heart of Thorns, mm-hmm. we had recorded a live version of the theme that's different. And, and that came out and I, and I was like, you know, it, it's not good enough. It's not done. I need to revise it. And so the version that's in that's on the soundtrack, uh, like on Spotify and that's that played in the game is different and somebody out there has ripped it and put it on youtube so you can hear the old version hear the new version hear hear how they're different oh. but we we recorded it twice one of the only times i've ever gone back and re-recorded something um that we'd already recorded once so how did it um, change what were the main differences between the two um a lot of it is in the horn melody uh it starts off similar um but there's a little bit more energy to the to the version the real the real version or the final version more more drums it builds up better the the b section is a little bit better i think it's a little more graceful the way it transitions into that and and transitions out of it and the big kind of finale brass stuff is is a little bit more interesting okay you should check it out it, it's out there on, on youtube um yeah it just feels it feels like the original version feels like a like a skeletal version like a you know what i mean um yeah uh it just Not doesn't it just flesh on the bone yeah, yeah, that's that's basically it, um, in my opinion. Um, okay. But some people love that one, but because that's the first one they heard, right? That's that's the other thing I've learned is that there's there's a lot of recency bias, and people will say, you know, well, the most recent thing that I love is like well, I love that the most, and this new thing is not like that thing, so I don't like it. And so I've, sometimes I have to learn to read between the lines of people's commentary. Um, right. And with so, but with Path of Fire, I will say that the for the theme on that one, the, the criticism of it, I think is valid, but it took me a while to come around to that. So my, my thought process with that one was, uh, you know, Guild Wars uh, has so much like epic music where it's just loud and horns blasting away and like triumphant, heroic. And I thought, you know, do we need to do that all the time? Uh, mm-hmm. Just like, it's like eating the same meal over and over and over again. And sometimes that's what people want. Uh, but I thought, here's a chance. Why don't we just do something different just this time? I'm so sick of just writing, you know, fortissimo brass, just like just do something different, you know? And um, when I was working on that theme, there was the way, the way the intro, the way that the, that game starts was different than a little bit different than Heart of Thorns, where there's sort of a prologue where you're still in mainline Tyria. Right, and right. You, there's an hour-ish of story content, and then you um, are in Lion's Arch, and you get on the airship, and you take that over the water, uh, and there's a cinematic that plays, and then you land in Ilona. So um, I thought, well, uh, we don't need to immediately get to this like Ilona sound um, because we're not there yet. So I don't want the th- I want the theme to sort of hint at it, but not be like heroic Ilona stuff. And then it spits you out in Tyria and you're like, well, what's going on? <laughs> um, and then, and then at the same time, uh, I, at the time that, that, that I was working on it, um, Rogue One had just come out, which is, uh, you know, yeah. great movie. And the, and they, they have had a very interesting dilemma, which uh, not a lot of people I think have talked about, or maybe they haven't, I just am not aware of it, but you know, Star Wars obviously has, this unbelievable legacy of music. And of course the main title is probably the most famous main title in, in movie history and deservedly so. And that legacy of just like, bam, Star Wars and then the opening crawl and it's all just epic. And, you know, all of those mainline movies have started with that because it has to start with that. Well, Rogue One um, is the first, you know, if you sort of, if you discredit some of the weird like Ewok movies and some of the weird stuff that happened <laughs> that Disney doesn't like to talk about. Special. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Rogue One was the first high production Star Wars movie that wasn't going to have John Williams music and wasn't just a continuation of this Skywalker saga and Jedi and yeah. stuff. So that's a really that's a really tough spot to be in. And the way they solved that problem was they didn't have an opening crawl and they didn't have Michael Giacchino just try to replicate like a big theme. The movie starts with a cold open. It's just like 
here we go. Movie just starts and there's music, but it's not like, bam, bada, 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 you know, uh, and then there's essentially a prologue spoiler alert. If you haven't seen rogue one, you should go see it. Cause it's great. But you know, there's, there's 20, 15, 20 minutes of the opening scene, introducing the characters, setting, setting up the scenario and establishing the feel of that movie and, and that their take on star Wars, cause it feels very different, right? It feels like star Wars, but it's modern. It's shot differently. It's all this other sort of movie making technique stuff. So they go through all this cold open stuff for 15 minutes and then there's a moment uh, afterwards where the title card finally comes up where it's like Star Wars Rogue One. And there's just a big stinger that happens. It's not even a full main theme. It's just f- 10, 15 seconds of music. Um, and I thought, well, that's cool. Like, that's kind of what we're doing. We have this sort of cold open where you are interior. And then there's a, tr- uh, a cinematic that plays where you tr- traverse to Ilona and then you end up there. So why don't we do something like that where we have a main theme that just sort of hints at the sound of it and a melody. And then the real main theme will, will play during that cinematic. Um, and they are related. I forget what it's called on the soundtrack, but they sound like kind of, it sounds like a, a reprise of the, of the main theme. Um, and I thought, well, it doesn't need to be super epic. And then the other thing I had in mind was also um, like James Bond movies. James Bond movies all start with that cold open. And then you get the moment where it's like, and you're like, yes, Bond. But it always comes after the opening scene. So I just kind of wanted to do that and and not have it be over, hit you over the head uh, hero stuff. Sure. The problem is um, what I realized. So nobody liked it. I mean, people like it, but but the 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 comment that I've seen to this day still see the most is that they're just like, oh, I'm so sick of the hearing the path of fire theme when I log in. It's like just such a lame theme. It's like doesn't get me excited. And then what I realized was they're not they're not judging it on the quality of the music, which I think is fine. And it's it's sound it sounds good. It's it's written well. It's orchestrated well. It's performed well, and okay. it, and it encapsulates the feel of Ilona. I think well. Yeah, but what it doesn't yeah. what it doesn't do is um, get you ex- excited to jump in. Right. And so that was when I, yeah, yeah, that was when I had to realize like, what, what's the function of a main theme is it to satisfy me or is it to, you know, kind of satisfy the player. And, and, it, you know, if somebody comes home from a long day of work or the kids finally go to bed or, or, you know, the wife's away for the week uh, on a work trip, whatever it is, um, when you sit down and log in, you want to just immediately be like, so excited. Like I'm about to play Guild Wars. Mm -hmm. And, and that theme didn't, it didn't do that enough. And I don't think it needed to be over the top Epic. I think what ended up, what ironically, um, when the game launched, there was a trailer, the launch trailer for Path of Fire. I took some elements of what we'd recorded live. I added some sampled elements. I kind of did some music editing to make it feel trailery. But that version of the main theme, you, it ends with the same melody that the that the in-game theme has. But it, but it's like epic. They just wanted it big, big, big trailer stuff, yeah. and that's probably it's, it was too late at that point. But that's probably what the main theme should have been because it, it works better and it sounds the same, and starts off like just gradually drifting in. But by the time you get to the end, it's like yes, path of fire, you know. Um, so, uh, you know, but I, it was too late with path of fire. It, it didn't work. People liked it, but the majority response was that it wasn't really that great of a main theme. Yeah. So I was well aware of that when it came time to do End of Dragons. Uh, And I thought, okay, if you want a main theme, I'm going to give you a main theme. And and this is a chance for me to go back and write what I thought were the mistakes of the Heart of Thorns theme and say, I'll write something in that vein that's as powerful and and sums up the game experience as much. But I'm going to do it with the perspective of at the time, 2020 McLean instead of 20, whatever it was, uh, 14 or so when I wrote um, the Heart of Thorns theme. So I'm going to make it awesome. And, I'm, and I, and I want to silence my critics. I want to I want to shut the haters yes. up, both about Path of Fire. And I want to like, I want them to say that, you know, this, some of them, not all of them, because th- that's impossible. But I want at least a portion of people to be like, I like this even better than the Heart of Thorns theme. Yeah. You know, I want, I want some new converts. And 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 the response to it was, has been pretty great, I will say. Yeah. Um, so it was it was what I had hoped for, and then you know beyond that, like I'm happy with it. I think it's I think it's pretty awesome. Like, it's it's catchy and it's and it tells the story of the game and introduces you to all these interesting new sounds you're going to be hearing and yeah and it's, and it's and, yeah yeah and, and then it's exciting, right? It's like it feels really good to hear. Yeah 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 
Yeah. I love it. That's cool. And that's got to be like, that's a neat moment because you, when going to the, 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 the Heart of Thorns theme, I imagine you were like, well, what's expected here? When going to yeah. the Path of Fire theme, you're like, well, what do I want? Like, I've done what's expected. What, what do I want to see? And the, now End of Dragons is sort of like, oh, you're able to, and you're in a position now where you're integrating what you want and what is expected. And that is a, 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 a very hard thing to do, I think. Yeah, yeah. And also, you know, introduce new elements, right? Like, it, to me, it still pushes the sound of the game forward while doing, while balancing those, those other things, which are very delicate. Like, I'm happy, players are happy, and it's new, right? Or new enough that it, that that element of unfamiliarity like enhances the excitement of the music. Right. right. Um, so it just kind of, it's like makes things a little exponent exponentially better. Excuse me. And that was, um, it was part of what my conversation with the studio was when they asked me to, to do end of dragons. Cause at that, at that point, you know, for people who might be watching this that don't know, uh, it was maybe three years ago now uh, that the studio went through these a massive round of layoffs. Um, they laid off like a third of the studio, so many people, and it was pretty traumatic uh, for a lot of people um, and uh, definitely traumatic for morale. Uh, no and and then for me, it, it just seemed like a good opportunity to step back a bit from Guild Wars because I was feeling pretty burnt out and mm -hmm. and creatively drained. I, I, I just wasn't sure what else I had to say for the for this game. And and. I needed more variety in my day-to-day -day work that I wasn't I wasn't getting. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, you know, for Living World season five, I wrote some music for it, but it's very sparse, you know. And it would be maybe one new track per release. And some episodes came out, and I didn't didn't have any new music in it. Part of it was because I was working on the expansion. But um, for that, for like a maybe a year, the better part of a year after those layoffs happened, I did very very little Guild Wars work. And when um, uh, Drew, Drew Katie, he he stepped down as the audio director and kind of went on sabbatical for a while. Mm. And then there was another person that came in as the audio director through Living World Season 5, um, and then for, or at least for part of it. And then there was some more shuffling and Drew came back, right? And so when Drew came back, he called me and said, you know, do you want to do, would you be interested in coming back for the End of Dragons score? Because he knew how I felt about my work on the game and I just needed uh, you know, I needed my own sabbatical. Yeah. And I said, yeah. you know, he sort of gave me the pitch as to what it would be with the, the, um, uh, Kanta sort of high tech aspect of it. And then the focus on Korea and what that might mean for the music. And I said, well, that, that's, that's exciting, uh, because it feels new. And I said, if I'm going to come back, then, th then this has to be the best music that the game's ever had. Like we have to, we have to push it so that everything about it is better than anything that's come before, um, both from a production standpoint, you know, uh, hire a, a different caliber of musician, not to denigrate the, the people from before, but it's just, you know, there's certain things that, that um, different players. And different, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, and, and, you know, and then I, and then that also puts a lot of pressure on me to, to push my own writing and figure out how to balance all these disparate elements um, and, you know, fortunately, I think, I think it all came together. Uh, but, but, but like, my point is that, you know, <clears throat> those elements that make the main theme exciting are, I think, pervasive in the rest of the score in that it all comes together to not just be incrementally better. It, to me, it's exponentially better than everything that's come before it. Um, and that was my goal. And, and it's one of those really, really rare scenarios that almost never happens in, in any creative field where you start at the very beginning with an idea in your head of what you want it to be like. And then it is that at the end, you know, uh, that almost never happens. And that doesn't mean wow. it, my concept of what it would be didn't change along the way. It definitely did. But the high level goal was always to, to produce the best soundtrack we possibly could. And, and I think we, I think we got there, you know, I'm very proud of it. Yeah. And I've seen an amazing response from it online. I loved it. Um, my, my, my MMO buddy who I played through with, uh, end of dragons with loved it too uh there are so many neat little moments the the technical uh the, the kind of jade jade punk type sounds creeping into the soundscape i love all yeah. the new instruments um the battle music somehow i i i'm i'm a gamer who really doesn't like battle music most of the time it yeah, kind of seems like 
like rude and like oh i'm just i'm trying to play the game like leave me alone <laughs> yeah i'm not i'm not a, i'm not a fan either which which oh. i've said i've said i've gone on the record many 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 times about that oh really <laughs> yeah what, yeah what, I, what what is it about battle music that that we don't like do you think can you can you channel that yeah i mean i find it exhausting to listen to but um so from a listener standpoint i just you know it it can it it can kind of demonstrate a composer's technical prowess, which can be impressive in the same way that like crazy prog rock or metal can be. Um, and, and I like, you know, I like some sort of the original old guard of prog rock, like yes. And Genesis, I, I love that stuff, sure. um, but it's not because it's complex. It, it's like, it's still good. And then has just enough complexity and to make it interesting um, complexity for the sake of complexity. I, I don't find interesting. Um, and so, you know, but for for some people, combat music can be uh, a chance to yeah flex a little bit, mm. uh, you know, bust out all the musical tricks. But but I just find it tired. Like like for instance, um, I love John Williams. Love him, right? He's amazing. I think he's incredible. Yeah. And objectively speaking, the production on the scores for the prequels is better than the original movies. That doesn't mean the performances are better, but like. Uh, you know, the, they're record the, the original ones are recorded in a studio that's, that's a little bit dead sounding. You know, if you sort of listen to them, it's still these amazing, you know, British musicians who are incredible and playing at virtuosic levels, but it's just, you know, it's sort of, I don't think anybody knew how important or special it was at the time. Yeah. Um, and then by, by the time they get to uh, return of the Jedi, it's produced a little bit, better. they get the production level of them gets a little bit better as they go along. But then for, um, uh the prequels you know he he got to do all three of those uh at abbey road with an uh you know uh, his team of people that he had been working with now for decades and he's much more comfortable with his writing but the problem with those scores is you know he has to kind of go backwards from the original movies which have all this amazing thematic material well he has to kind of do a like a a prequel version of those so he can't right break out some of his strongest themes he has to just kind of hint at them and say what's what's a reduced version of this and so yeah. to me they're less what they're less intro into the theme that we all know exactly yeah. and so to me that that makes them less interesting because they're less catchy there's just less to grab onto mm. and then um you know like the second one is kind of the biggest offender even though the second one has my favorite of the concert suites it has across the stars which i think is such a beautiful piece of music yeah. uh but but it's it's like almost all just combat music and I, I, I hate it. It's like people love those prequel scores because it's John Williams that is like mu most muscular, just like, bam, kind of like crazy combat music. And I'm like, this stuff is so tiring to listen to. It's just mm -hmm. always dialed up to 10. There's no interesting melodies and stuff. To, like I can still in my head, you know, hum the music for when the TIE fighters attack the Millennium Falcon when they escape the Death Star in the first one or the asteroid battle music. Like, it, all, all that stuff from the original trilogy is all seared into my brain. And there's nothing about the combat music in, uh, in, or the battle music in, uh, in the prequels that is remarkable. So it, to me, it's just, is it's masked by more is more. Right. And maybe he, I don't know what he, how he feels about it. So I don't like, I never like listening to those. I'll listen to the concert suite arrangements that he does of like Anakin's theme and, and uh, across the uh, stars and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I never go back and revisit them because I think they're really dull, even though they sound great. Uh, so with in games and specifically with Guild Wars, you know, there's a couple things at play here. So with combat music, it for me I don't like it. So it's tedious to write, right? And so it and and because it has to, you have to fill up so much space and keep the energy going and not just be just sit on like one sort of drum or string rhythm the whole time. You got to like mix it up a bunch you end up putting in a ton of effort for a relatively short amount of music, right? So it'll take me all day to write like 30 seconds of music. I'm just like, ah, sucks. Like, and I got to pick it up tomorrow and try to get this to two minutes or three minutes. And it's exhaust. Like the notes per capita is, is like way out of whack for me. Um, uh -huh. So I, so I don't enjoy the process of writing it, which that's, that's the hard, you know, that's like the foundation of it all. It's hard to overcome that. I don't like listening to it. Uh, and then in game, you know, in a game like Guild Wars, if you're hearing combat music, what's happening is you're in a fight, right? And Guild Wars doesn't even trigger combat music until you 
cross over a certain threshold of how long you've been fighting an enemy or a group of enemies and how many enemies you're fighting. Mm -hmm. So you might be in a, in a uh, battle with five or six, you know, Aetherblade bandits or whatever around you, just casting spells. And, you know, there's all sorts of cacophony happening. And then on top of that, you have to pile on all this music. Like what's more important, you know, really complex orchestral writing um, or the sound of your spells being cast, right? And then on top of that, the nature of the game uh, is it's an MMO. So you're probably playing with other people. And if you are playing it with other people, you might not even have the music turned on because you're talking to your guildmates on Discord or something. Mm -hmm. So then it's like, what the fuck is the point of even <laughs> writing this music? Spending all this effort doing something that makes me miserable that I don't think is both you know, satisfying creatively or even practical for the situation it plays in. And then in, in the end, somebody just goes whoop and turns it down. So yes. I, I don't like, I'm like, I don't want to do it. And, and since Path of Fire, for the most part, I've been able to just farm it out to people who are good at it um, and been able to guide the direction a little bit so that it's not just hundred piece orchestra, hundred piece choir, just loud, 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 loud. You know, I, I think with, um, with End of Dragon specifically, you know, Korean music, traditional Korean music has this amazing percuss percussion tradition. And I thought, well, percussion is great. What's uh, so what's, you know, if you distill it down to its essence. What's the point of combat music? It's to uh, create and sustain tension or build up tension um, and keep keep sort of energy going in a, in a fight scenario. Uh, well, what's the thing that does that the best? Percussion, you know, and for some people, they see that as a cop out because they want to hear all the bells and whistles and tricks of you know, orchestras flying all around and modulating to 10 billion different keys and crazy time signatures and stuff. <laughs> but, you know, percussion is quick and effective. And to me, it's, I don't care if it's not interesting to listen to outside of the game. It's, it, it's primary function should be, what does it do in the game? Right. And, right. and um, percussion, it just does that. It gets to that, it gets to that much faster than anything else does. Mm -hmm. um, and so fortunately uh, there's this amazing percussion tradition in traditional Korean music and I'm not an expert in it, so let's find the expert. And that was what Andy Rosalind ended up being. And Andy ended up being much more than just writing combat music. But that was how our conversation started because he's cool. um, has this amazing background for 30 years studying both traditional Western composition and traditional Korean music. And so he has a fundamental understanding of what makes this stuff Korean um, on all levels. So harmonic, melodic, and then rhythmic. Uh, and, and he just did an amazing job of incorporating that stuff working it into guild war making it guild warsy because we're not it's not korea we're not we didn't make a game set in in you know ancient korea mm -hmm. but um you know adapting that stuff into that scenario i think he did an incredible job and and like i said we've already got over the last 10 years uh there's more than enough just generic fantasy combat music in the game we, we don't we don't need any more and and i don't think it would make the expansion any better to just have more of that i think it has to be unique it has to feel like I'm in a fight in the story for End of Dragons, and yeah. and what, what will make it sound like that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So much of what you said resonates with me, uh, and that's an amazing story of how you have this this preference, which and, and <laughs> which is the other side of the coin from having this problem of I have to make combat music. I don't like combat music. What do we do about this? Yeah, and boiling it down to the percussion, which is of course like kind of like a heartbeat, the heartbeat of the music. Um, yeah. That's an amazing story, um, and like just anecdotally, like uh, from, from the, the perspective of someone playing the game, you know, I, I, an MMO is not a game you play for like five, ten hours. It's a game you play for like fifty or hundred hours. Like it's meant to be put a lot of time into. You, you, whatever you hear, you hear a lot. Whatever you hear that wears out your ears, you're gonna wear out your ears a lot. So the experience yeah. that I would have is, I'm like, oh, I'm gonna go down to Cantha. Let me turn the music on, and turn my Spotify off. And a big part of that for me was just having the combat music feel less draining, as you said. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. It has to be. A, it has to be a balance. And and if it works outside of the game, great. But if it doesn't, that's not really that's not really the, my concern. You know. Yeah, right thing for the right place makes sense. Well, uh, McLean, you've given me a lot of your time today. I really appreciate it. I, I want to ask you, like just to cap this off um what's next for you um 
you're very clearly always pushing the boundaries and trying to find the next thing that's going to that's going to push you personally and elevate your work what are you looking towards uh well at the moment i'm kind of just enjoying the you know um the denouement from releasing end of dragons it was it was a lot of work to get it out and then it was a lot of work to promote it and talk about it and share it with the world and 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 kind of join in the excitement and now the dust has settled a little bit so you know i was really really busy uh all through the development of that and up until launch and probably for the next month or so after that uh but the next uh there is another game that i that i was working on concurrently and uh and then had a very very busy couple of weeks as i tried to finish it up very recently that'll be coming out um I'm not sure when this will go out there, but you know, uh, it's the end of April as we're recording this, and um, yeah. it'll be out in a in a couple of weeks. Uh, a game called Salt and Sacrifice, oh, cool. which which is um, not at all like Guild Wars. It's uh, it's kind of a spiritual successor to a game called Salt and Sanctuary that came out maybe five six years ago uh, by a. A studio it's complicated but the original studio was called ska studios now it's sort of a partnership between them and another developer under this new banner called devoured devoured studios um but one of the the, the guy who's sort of the the uh, you know not it's it's a two-man operation but one of my uh, somebody i've known for a long time is the guy who made salt and sanctuary uh and is making salt and sacrifice um with the help of another another game developer and uh he used to do all the music himself and then i was like hey you know if you want to want some help with this uh feel free to ask so so he relinquished that which i i'm grateful for um and that'll be coming out may 10th on oh, um cool. playstation 4 and playstation 5 and in the uh, epic game store on pc and it's cool it's kind of, it's like a 2d souls soulsborne type game uh, very difficult with challenging bosses, but it has a really fun aesthetic that I like to describe as like if the doodles in the margins of your notebook from high school like came to life. That's kind of what the game looks like. Yeah, it's 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 really cool. It's got a handmade feel, and the fact that these guys were able to make a game of this scope, just the two of them, it, it, you know, is pretty amazing to me. Um, so that'll be out very soon. And I'm very excited about that. Totally different from Guild Wars, very nasty and dark and heavy and oppressive kind of sounds. Um, but some cool stuff happening in there. And then I'm about to sign on, uh, you know, at the moment it's sort of a handshake agreement, but it's about to become formal in the next couple of weeks for a game that of course I can't talk about, but, uh, it will be out this year, not Guild Wars. Um, but I'm, I, it's like, Speaking of Mount Rushmore's again, this game this game is from a studio that is on my Mount Rushmore, and I'm so excited to talk about it. Uh, it's going to be really cool. I, you know, I've already seen some of it. It looks beautiful. It's a really cool studio. Their aesthetic that they try to you know incorporate into their stuff is is incredible, and and I'm sort of part of a very cool legacy that that uh, that you know again, if you went back and told young McLean that eventually you'd get to this point he would he would have been very excited so more news on that soon hopefully um hopefully by the summer i'll be able to talk about that and uh and then who knows that's pretty much that's the majority of this year we'll see what happens you know the door is always open for more guild war stuff um I, I i don't you know i'm a little detached now that i'm not in this working in-house uh from what goes on day to day but they sort of um give me the courtesy of keeping me up to date uh you know because of my relationship with them so i'm assuming there will be more to come but i, I don't know um for sure uh but uh hopefully that that'll happen you know sooner rather than later as well and uh and yeah lots of fun things on the horizon that i can't wait to find out what that game is salt and sacrifice i think i actually played the their their the, the original game that they made back in the day so that's really exciting for me yeah and, it's gonna be um, cool I'm looking forward to that. Also, um, Guild Wars 2 just announced Expansion 4, so um, who knows uh, when the work on that will begin, but hopefully we'll Who knows? I, I, I don't know. I'm not, yeah, I'm not, uh, I'm not sort of obfuscating. I truly don't know what the deal is with that. I, I learned mm -hmm. the same day that everybody else did that that was happening, uh, but I, you know, I would be honored and grateful to come back for the music for that because working on guild wars has you know allowed me to do everything i kind of ever dreamt of as a kid and and has introduced me to this amazing community and 
coworkers that, you know, uh, you know, and not just coworkers and colleagues, but friends, you know, I forged some amazing relationships and friendships as a result of that game. So I, I will always, uh, I will always work on it. If, if the stars align. Amazing. Thank you, McLean. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, my privilege. Thanks so much. And thank you everyone for listening to the Deeg podcast. I'm Deeg. More interviews soon. I'll see you then. Take care.